Well, greetings, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome to another Thursday night here at the Sports Crib. I see uh, Mr. Uh, Demetrius uh, is in the queue already, uh, cornbread and Kool-Aid, I see, uh, is representing here. Uh, still wait for Bill and a couple of the other guys, but uh, Demetrius, how are you doing this evening? Mr. King, it's good to be back with you. <clears throat> Not quite 100%, so if the voice goes a little or I get a cough in every now and then, I get the I get the disclaimer out of the way. I apologize, but it's always good to spend the Thursday night in the crib with you and the guys. Um, I'm glad to be back. Yeah, you, you sound a whole lot better than you did last week. <laughs> <laughs> last week. I wanted to give it a go last week, and I just thought, don't nobody want to listen to this. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hear this. So, so I thought it was probably better to, to give it another week, and uh, it's much, much better. Uh, so uh, uh, I've been good. Uh, weather out here in California has been good to us, so not too bad. Kind of seasonal, so uh, hey, it's uh, July in Cali. So right. it's hot <laughs> you know, everywhere. I mean, the short answer know. is it's hot <laughs> everywhere, but hotter in California <laughs> than anywhere in the Midwest. So. Well, well it, it, the thing is, though, you know, San Diego, you got the ocean breeze, yeah. man. You yeah, know, you're it's, in not, spot. It, it's not quite like LA where, you know, you, you, you're kind of stuck inland unless you're rich. Yeah. You know, right, right. You, you know, parts so. out there feel like you're in the desert. And that yeah. is trifling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, a lot of I people mean, realize that. There are a lot of areas around LA that are like desert, and that heat uh, is serious. Oh, uh, you know, hey, you can uh, go just a few miles outside of San Diego, outside up here in the mountains, and, you know, during the day, it, it gets, uh, you know, you, you take your eggs with you and, and a skillet. <laughs> <Probably. laughs> and, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. but then, you know, then two minutes later, you could jump off the cliff and, and be in the ocean. So, yeah, you know, so yeah, but uh, yeah, think uh, a lot of things happened uh, this week, uh, and uh, we're gonna get to a lot of them, but uh, I'm gonna start off uh, here since we don't get to see you that often uh, <laughs> to talk about your pistons. Uh, they have a, a, a really uh, young trio here put together. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are wondering, you know, like when you look down at that East roster, uh, and uh, I think you t last year you said give you two years. So yep. how, are you, how are you with the progress that you're making, your young core and your future? Yeah, I'm fighting to accelerate. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm struggling to not push this thing up a year. But but Troy Weaver is the GM of the Pistons, and um, he will win an Executive of the Year award pretty soon. So get ready for that. That's happening in the next two years. What he's done to remake this roster is kind of unprecedented. Like two years ago when he took this job in June of 2020, they had an albatross of a contract belonging to Blake Griffin who didn't play for us, but we were paying him $31 million. We had dead money to a guy named Josh Smith that we haven't seen in years. Um, we didn't have any young talent. Uh, we had a team of guys like Reggie Jackson, good guys, but there was no direction. The salary cap was a mess. And, and in two years, through drafting, through shrewd, shrewd trades, he has taken this roster and, and put this team in a position to where they are right now. And I called this, I said a year ago, Really good time to be a sports fan in Detroit. All four teams are about to go up. <clears throat> I think the Lions are in a great spot, and we'll talk about them when that time comes, a different day. But right now for the Pistons, I think about their core. And for people who aren't really deep into the Pistons or, or they're just a sort of fringe team for you, they might be the youngest team in the league, by the way. That's critical to note. Youngest team in the are, league. I, I think they are. Yeah. Uh, with the trio that I, I named, I think. Yeah, that does give them that. Yeah. So it, so two years ago, 20, 2020 draft, they got three good players, two really good players and a guy I haven't give up on. They got a guy named Sadiq Bay, one of the good young shooters in the league. Isaiah Stewart, undersized big man who who's pull, who's stretching his range out now. And they got a young Australian kid named Killian Hayes, who who still hasn't come into his own. He's battled injuries. I'm a Killian Hayes guy, so I'm not giving up on him. Last year, they took Cade with the number one pick. 
quietly took a guy from the school I don't talk about named Isaiah Livers. <laughs> but but once he became a Piston, I forgot about that school, who's actually a really good player. And then see, this year, you, you seem to be forgetting that the origin of a couple of these guys here. What was that? <laughs> that she was taking those guys. He, he put me in this pickle, right? Where it's like, do I acknowledge what school those guys are in? Or is Aiden Hutchinson really just a lion? So, so I, I, I sort of acknowledge that Isaiah Livers went to a certain school in a certain city that I don't generally talk about. But Isaiah Livers is a good basketball player, right? So this young core is good. Then they, they basically got gifted Marvin Bagley for nothing, re-signed him for three years, and he is still a really good player. So they've got this core with Cade and Livers and Bay and Stewart and Hayes. Then they go get Jay Nivey, possibly the most exciting player in this draft. Um, I think when this draft's all said and done, Jay Nivey's going to be the guy. Just like last year, even though Scotty Barnes won Rookie of the Year, and you hear about Evan Mobley, the best player in last year's draft's name is Cade Cunningham. You will figure that out sooner or later. So, so, and then they, they made a shrewd move with the Knicks where, and I need to explain this to people what they did with the Knicks because it's yeah, so ridiculously they, cool, right? <laughs> they made a trade and took Kimba Walker's contract for lack of a better term, $9 million. They agreed to a $6.5 million buyout with Kimba. Then they made another trade with the Knicks and got Nerlens Noel and Alec Burke, a shooter and a big on expiring deals. Plus they got cash from the Knicks. Guess how much cash they got? Six million. So the Knicks just paid for Kimba's buyout, and and the Pistons get roughly forty million plus in cap room next year. It's these like under the radar things. If we like Burke, we resign him. If we like Noel, we resign him. But if we don't resign Burke's Noel, Kimba, and the expiring contract of Kelly Olynyk plus a couple other moves, the Pistons are sitting next summer with the core I just talked about all under contract on rookie deals and forty plus million in cap space. You got your you got your backcourt of the next five, six, seven years. Stewart can shoot, uh, stretching his game out now. Bay is one of the better young shooters in the league. And and Duran is 18. He's 18 years old. He's only going to get better. I mean, I love what they've done, obviously, right? But the flexibility, and quietly, I don't want to assume we're just going to wait till next summer. There's stuff that's going to still happen this summer, right? If If, if the Knicks... No, no. The Nets and the Lakers want to get together and do something with Westbrook and Kyrie. You know who can help them out? There's three teams that can help them out. One of those teams is the Detroit Pistons because we're one of three teams with cap space. We can facilitate that deal, eat Russ's contract, pick up some draft picks, have somebody give us some money, buy out Russ. Now we're up around $50 million in cap space next summer. We don't keep Russ. Russ can go play wherever he wants. We buy him out for some small number that one of the other teams pays us to do. And that's the flexibility you have. And then he can pick up even more picks. So the restoration in general is in a great place. Um, I love the talent. I love the athleticism of Duran. He's a rim runner. He can defend. Um, they can toss him lobs. I know how you feel about Cade because I'm pretty sure he was on your fantasy team last year. <laughs> so you know a lot about Cade. Um, Jay Nivey is one of the fastest players in the league right now. I mean, dribbling a basketball one end of the floor to the other, it's 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 a joy to watch. And that puts pressure on defenders. It changes the pace of the game. He just he made Cade better. He makes Sadiq better. They can do things now that they couldn't dream about two years ago and they really could only wish to do last year. With this young backcourt and all these young bigs, whether it's Noel, Bagley, Stewart, they, they're big and they're young and they're athletic. They, they need a little more shooting, but they're in a position with cap flexibility, with tradable pieces like Olenek's oh, expiring deal, Noel's expiring deal, Alec Burke's expiring deal. Expiring deals are one of the hottest commodities you can have in the NBA. Come February, there are going to be teams looking for a good player who they won't only have to pay for a couple months. And the Pistons will just – Troy Weaver has shown that he understands – this very well he's being patient more patient than the fans and so your your general question was how do i feel about it i feel great but i have to be patient i'm gonna need you to tell me every thursday hey hey be patient because i'm gonna because they're gonna have a stretch of eight or ten games where we're gonna be talking about them and you're gonna have to go calm down bro you told me another year because i'm ready and and i'm excited about this team i might be more excited about the pistons than about the lions and you know how i feel about the lions rebuild 
Yeah, I, I see Bill is, is here also, but uh, a subject that we had last week, uh, and uh, I wanted to get your take on this because we always talk about finances and the futures of young men. Yep. And one of the things that the commissioner wanted to do was lower the age from 19 to 18. Yeah. We have a lot of stories about it, a, a lot of sports figures that have gotten these huge amounts of money and by the time they're your age or younger, they're broke. Right. You know, I mean, you know, they, they, they might not be homeless yet, but you know, it, more or less living paycheck to paycheck, if yeah. that. Now, uh, w what is your thoughts on, on that and the financial responsibility of the NBA if they're going to lower the age? Oh, that's a great question. I gotta be honest. I, so my feeling, yeah, my feeling is one, it's a year. We're basically talking about a year. So I believe, and I have always believed, there's a guy. There's the guy, Mr. Carroll. Uh, my <laughs> feeling in general is that responsibility is not on the league. That responsibility is on their parents. Um, I take being a parent very seriously. I, I got very lucky in the parent lottery. Um, I think that you're gonna have a certain group of people who are raised well. I happen to be watching a documentary on a former Yankee shortstop. And one of the biggest things they spent the first episode on was talking about how well he was raised. Yep. So, so there will be guys who will come in right out of high school because there are people around them who tell them, you can go, you can play. I hope that they have an agent or an old teacher or friend or someone who says, hey, let me introduce you to this thing called a mutual fund. <laughs> right? Right? You want somebody in their life to tell them that. You're, Someone who says your your earning capacity, like a guy like Bill Carroll, his skills are his skills. Bill can do what he does and probably make a ton of money for the rest of it. My skills are my skills. I'm really good at what I do in real life. Those skills aren't going away. I, I can tear my Achilles tomorrow. I can still do my job, right? It won't matter. But, 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 but I, I got a little pushback on that, especially okay. you, know, you know, first of all, we have to talk about education. And the average student that graduates <laughs> has, e even though he has a diploma, he has a ninth grade, maybe a 10th grade education. Sure. How do you put the two words together to make him understand mutual and funds? Right. You don't. Right. No, right. So I, I guess maybe I misunderstood. I think the question is, I thought the question was, what's the responsibility of the league? I'm gonna boil that down to no, no, well, well, the, well. The reason why I said, you know, if the league is the one that wants to lower the age, I think that they have to have some type of responsibility. Oh, that's just where we disagree. Adam Silver okay. runs a okay. business. Okay. Yeah, Adam okay. Silver runs a business. Okay. He is not gonna right. make. He's not gonna make a single 18 year old kid put his name in the draft. He will not. <laughs> now, if you choose to do it, and the teams evaluate you and think you're talented enough, they'll select you. You'll probably make more money in three years than most people make in their life. Right. But but Adam Silver is running a business. That's his job. I am never the one who puts the responsibility of raising young kids on anybody other than their parents and the circle around them. Um, do I think the league wants kids to come? Oh, no, no. The league wants people to be successful. Right. They have a PR element. So I, so I think my answer now that I more understand the question is they will have things in place. They'll do rookie symposiums. They'll try and get these kids advisors. They will vet sports agents to make sure these guys aren't crooks. The league will do as much as they're capable to, capable of within their within their bandwidth, right? But I, I would never say, oh, the league did them a service. I watched the 30 for 30 call broke. It wasn't the NFL's fault. These guys were going out <laughs> buying five cars, and they were having a bunch of kids out of wetlock. This, this wasn't about it. There's nothing the NFL could have done to stop those things from happening. So my hope is that. Parents are better. league mandated vasectomies, <laughs> which, which should be a conversation, <laughs> right? Right, but it would it wouldn't get through the Republican. No, right, never mind. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> right. I I don't know that a league should ever try and take on that responsibility. That's a that's a can of worms you don't want to open up as a league. Remember, you're if you open up the can of worms, then you got to eat it. Exactly, and I I feel Adam Silver doesn't want any part of that, and and. My argument for the league would be, we're talking about a year. 
you're telling me I'm risking that kid's life if I let him come this year, but he can go to Duke or Michigan State for that matter, go to 15 or 18 classes. If that. <laughs> right, if that. Declare. Don't show up for any classes in, in spring term. Declare. And now he's in a better position because he went and party for four months in East Lansing. And those are some great parties. They really are. <laughs> so I don't I don't know that the one year is a big deal. And I don't know that that's the league's responsibility. Right. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I, I think you, you, you were here last week uh, when we talked about that. Uh, uh, the league wanting to, get, to go from uh, 19 to 18. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I have another question for guys because it, it seems to be an ongoing uh, well it, it, it seems to be getting momentum uh, uh, we saw talked about it the SBs LeBron James has come out uh, and uh, you know a lot of people are talking about the Brittany Griner situation now I'm kind of perplexed about this because Okay, on one hand, I understand capitalism. Okay, you, you want to make as much money as you can, you know. Mm -hmm. But I find it hard to, to, to feel sorry for someone that's a multi-millionaire that's going to play a sport in another country and you more or less know the political climate of the sure. world during doing this. Well, time. okay. One, if you want to be a multi- oh, 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 hold on, hold on, Bill. Oh, I hold thought uh, uh, you know, uh, So I, I, I understand the capitalism part, but I don't feel sorry for someone that's making that kind of money. So when when when, when the average person like like you or, or, or even Demetrius is, is you know, <laughs> it is, it, 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 it is making her taxes. <laughs> well, okay. One, if you are a female high-level athlete, you have to go someplace else to be. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there isn't that kind of money. You're going you, 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 you to tell me you can't live off of $900,000 a year? You can't make that in the United States, though. Uh, that's not what I asked you. That, that's not what I asked you. You you're say telling, you, you, you're, telling me, you're telling me that her life is not comfortable enough where she has to go to another country in order for her to in feed order her to family. Make anything like what you're talking about yes you have to leave if you're a female athlete that's now that's a bigger discussion we could do a whole show about why that's true right but yes to make anything like the money you're talking about do you realize that they're making a huge financial sacrifice to play in the WNBA exactly. they're, they're working at a loss basically to play in the okay. WNBA the WNBA plays peanuts they they're, work, they, they they're working at a loss or the organization is working at a loss? They, this is how they subsidize playing in the WNBA, James. Exactly. They subsidize playing in the WNBA by making up the loss by playing overseas. And this is not her first year playing for that team. She's been with that team for years. This is where she's, This is how she makes her living. So Point number two. <laughs> the WNBA isn't how you make your living as a professional basketball player, unfortunately. Now, we can talk about fixing that, right? We can talk about making it so that you don't have to go overseas. But as of now, if you want to live – I'm not talking about living like the men do. I'm talking about having a, as you said, com solid, comfortable lifestyle. If you, you have to have residences in more than one place, right, because of the travel involved. Or it makes sense to have a residence in more than one place because of the travel involved. So you have some place you live in America and probably some place you live overseas. You may be renting or leasing or buying – either in one country or not, or not in the other. Who knows? Depending on how much time you spend in one country versus the other. But to make anything close to a million dollars as a woman professional athlete, you have to go. You have to leave. That's like that's not even debatable. Like That's just facts. Like, like, so that's, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, like most special people, um, she was under the impression that her status as – you know, she's bigger there than she is here, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, I mean, once again, a really good discussion could be had about why that's true. But she's bigger there than she is here. So she was under the impression. And once again, I don't know what she did or didn't actually have in that bait pen. That is still to be determined. 
Um, I do know what she's accused of, but acu accusations are not, right? Are not are not convictions. Uh, and and even if, well, let's see, that's a whole, like we'll leave that for later. But the point is that she's been. This is not her first rodeo. She's been playing overseas since she was twenty one, I think, right. and she's what thirty or approaching it. So she's been doing this for a while, James. This isn't new. And yes, things got messy between the United States and Russia, but she didn't think that. Frankly, she's not an envoy, an ambassador, a politician. Right. She's aware of it, but I mean, she lives in the bubble, James. Professional athletes live in a professional athlete bubble. Some of them are more politically plugged in and more aware than others. Steve Kerr, even one of those, of course, he comes from that. Like his father, as you know, died overseas in Lebanon as a as an ambassador. But 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 most professional athletes live in a professional athlete bubble where they think about what they're what they have to eat. What, where they got to work out, how much they got to work out, um, what their contract status is, unless they just signed one, in which case they're, yeah, they stopped people that for a year. The next year they worry about it again. Um, and then for some of them that like the party life, there's, you know, there's that, those thoughts as well, <laughs> right? Uh, some of them like to, you know, woo! but for those that are very serious and, you know, you know, have a solid home life and marriage or, or something like that, they're focused on their body, their contract, um, you know, like I said, all that good stuff. And then some of them have side businesses, right? Um, and they probably think about that as well. There's like, for, for most of them, probably about 8% of what's left goes towards knowing what's going on in the world. I mean, there's all these famous stories of people saying things to coaches during the Super Bowl press conferences about, you know, these major world events. They're like, huh? <laughs> right? But they have no idea what you're talking about. So I, she's aware of on some level, I'm sure of what was going on, but you th you think she's like throwing on CNBC or whatever first thing in the morning? I mean, I don't think you understand how pro athletes live, James. If you think that's what's going on, no. But but you just went through a very similar situation with the men and China, where China had threatened. The, I mean, you know, so that, right. That's Lamar, what I'm saying. Wait, I mean, even, even within yeah. even, even Lamar, within the sports world. Yeah. There's a certain amount of uh, recognition of your surroundings. I mean, you know, uh, you know. Well, well, yeah, but uh, we can't, just go ahead. Yeah, we can't ahead. ignore a couple of other facts. One, their window, career window, is limited. BT's got to make this bread now. Yep. She's not going to be. And and to Bill's point. I, oh, like I, I, said, I, I understand the capitalist okay. part of that. Okay, I, I you're gonna, okay. so here's the here's the political part, and I don't want to do a Monday show. <laughs> it was absolutely a political thing. And and the, the, from the information I know, what she took in, she's taken in before. This right. is, this, none of this is yeah, new. Party, like in this particular situation, and if this girl's name was Beth Jones, her ass would have been home weeks ago. Yep. If it was some random Beth Jones who was a, a dentist, she'd have been home weeks ago, right? Yeah. There's no mistaking some of this is that BG who's, is who she is. Yep. And to, Bill said, she's probably as popular over there more so. More so, the, w, the WNBA is a PR vehicle, so they can go over there and make real money. That's how this works. And her window's not like mine. Like my job requires international travel. You guys know I've, I can tell you places I've been. I've been to Poland, been to Czech Republic, Germany. I've been to China. Yeah. That's what my job is. Had if I were not willing to go to those places, my career wouldn't be where it is. I and I don't make nearly what they make. My <laughs> career wouldn't be where it is. That's a part of the job. And if my company came to me and said, hey, we need you to go run a project out of, I've been to a city called Komatov in the Czech Republic. I'll let you look it up and form your own opinion. But when it came to me and said, we got to go to Komatov, that's my job. That's how I make my bread. I need that direct deposit to hit every two weeks. I said, when are we going? Let's go. Did I do some research? Did I, did I, yeah, are we safe? Right, cool. But I've also done trips in Juarez, Mexico. <laughs> right, that's what you do. You because but you know, my window is long. I can do what I do until I drop. Yep. BG's got X number of years when she can make that kind of bread. Now, will she go into coaching, broadcast, what something probably, right? But or maybe not, maybe not. But right now, that's where she earns her real bread. And I think she did something in this case, she's done many times. Yep. She had no reason to believe it would be an issue. And because of the political climate, and she's not sitting around watching. <laughs> CNBC or whatever, Bill Rep. She doesn't know. She doesn't know if that if they stop me this time, some different person trying to make some different point is going to use me as an example. She has no way of knowing it. I wouldn't expect her to know that. 
I don't know if anybody in her circle would have assumed that. It's BG. She's famous. They know me. They know me. It's like me walking into the donut shop here in town. I expect certain things. You 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 know I'm coming because I come three times a week. You didn't batch up any cream fills today. We got a problem. Who, who's running the joint today? Right? So I, I think it's there's a piece of it that is her window is such that not playing overseas kind of is not a smart business move. But I don't think she expected this. And now it's just it's way out of hand. And there's another conversation about if this were Steph Curry, would the government be doing more? If this were, you know, name person X, you know, if it was Bill Carroll, would they be doing? I don't know. Probably not. Bill, Bill would got himself out of it. It wouldn't have been no big deal. <laughs> um, so, so, so there's, there's all kinds of conversations around BG. My feeling really is, um, it is, it is your classic political thing though. Yep. And, and she'll be home. It's way too late. We need to get her home. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't go back and go eat. Uh, female basketball players not playing overseas. That's not a that's not a topic we need to discuss on a sports crib because it's never gonna it's not gonna end anytime soon. That league doesn't pay them enough to not do it. It's like Joe DiMaggio used to sell vacuums in, in off season, right? right. <laughs> or something like that. I don't even know if that's true, but you know what I mean. They, they well, don't yeah, have the coffee makers certainly was right, right. Coffee makers, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that's yeah. a great pull by Bill Carroll right there, man. Mr. <laughs> coffee, that was a great pull. <laughs> But yeah. I mean, to his point, Brittany's got maybe five more years, yeah. five more good years left. Yeah. She's 31. She's got maybe five more good years left before something breaks down or whatever, or she's not, just not considered to be that good anymore. And then she's got to coast on that for a while because she's a, a six, seven and change out lesbian with tattoo. Yeah. With a so voice, right? broadcasting right. may or may not be in the car. Right. I was about to say, her <laughs> voice is not conducive for broadcasting. That's not a criticism. That's just a reality. Right. Yeah. Right, right, you know, uh, but uh, you know, I just thought I'd I, I just put it by you guys to see. Uh, that's a good conversation, what, what in my about. Yeah, yeah, that's a good conversation. Uh, LeBron has said that uh, reportedly he's seen enough of Westbrook. Uh, <laughs> Join the club, LeBron. <laughs> Where have you been, bro? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we always, you know, Bill, you know, you, you always tell us about the money. <laughs> well, I mean, so, I mean is, is Westbrook going to be a Laker next year? Well, I mean, so I know I've said this before. Who wants him and will pay him what he's owed? If you, unless you can answer that question, you don't need to ask the other question. If you can come up with an answer to the who wants him and will pay that money, then we can talk about the other thing. Until you have an answer to question number two, question number one doesn't even matter. Yeah, I, uh, I, I the think, Demetrius, he, he wasn't here doing your, you know, when we were talking about the, the Pistons, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's the deal. What's got to happen? It's it's only three teams: the Spurs, the Pistons, and one more who I can't remember. I feel like I want to say the Pelicans, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's the Pacers. They're gonna have to get a third team involved, right? Yep. And what happens is the Pistons or somebody like the Pistons take Russ and his contract, promptly buy him out. But what you got to do to get Troy Weaver to do that? You're going to need to give him two number ones yep. and some of the cash that yep. he's got to pay Westbrook on the buyout, just yep. like we did with Kimber Walker. We basically got the Knicks to pay for Kimber Walker's buyout, and we got Nerlens Noel and Alec Burks and deal and 40 something million in cap space. For the Pistons, it's about that cap space next year. They could call Troy Weaver tonight and say, Look, we'll give you a one, and Brooklyn will give you a one. We need you to take Westbrook in this deal and, and some cash. That's and Troy good. Weaver might say, Cool. Cool. Give me this amount of cash. Immediately negotiate a buyout. Westbrook can go play wherever he wants. That yep. money is essentially on our books for a year while our young players get better. And then next summer, we've got $45 million in cap space. That's the only way you get him off your That's roster. You now, it. it's the same trick that Brooklyn needs for Kyrie. And ultimately, Brooklyn's going to – I don't know if Brooklyn's on the agenda. But if they're not, that's how they keep Durant. Because I'll wait. That's how you do it. There's no way the Lakers – because Bill just said it. Nobody's going to take Westbrook's straight contract up. straight up and go, yes. <laughs> this ball what? dominant, bad what? shooting, $40 million. That makes no sense. What? So you, you're going to have to make somebody help you. You help literally help you. Even the New York Knicks would laugh at you if you proposed exactly. that. Exactly. So, so you're going to have to. And that's and it's it's the Spurs probably won't do it because it would cost too much. But, but all Troy Weaver wants is some draft picks. Give me a couple draft picks and some of the cash for the buyout. We'll help you out. 
Because for us, it's just he's never going to suit up. He'll never wear a Piston jersey. We'll buy him out and take that $40 million in cap space next year. The That's closest- the only way they can do it. Like the jersey you want to get, because it'll be the only one, is the one that's at the press conference. You get that one, you got to collect your side. <laughs> I don't know if you ever have a press conference. I think you're just honest with everybody right up front. We're not going to schedule this press conference. We're going to keep them sandwiches and those snacks for the next media session. You don't even need to waste your time. Uh, well, now uh, I'm going to let you lead off the next one because there's an anonymous GM. This says everyone knows that KD, KD is not winning another title without Steph. So do I get I get this one? You get this yeah. one. That that dude ain't anonymous. His name is Bob Myers. We know exactly <laughs> who said that. We know, we know exactly who said that. The oh, cigarette right. smoking man in the parking garage. You know exactly. who he is. Exactly. You can't pull that hat down far enough, bro. We know who you are. Um, um yeah. And oh, all that being said, he might not be wrong. <laughs> he might not be wrong. Um, I'm a KD guy, so uh, uh, personally, I you know you can say whatever you want about him. I I think he is a he is a once in a lifetime unique set of skills. Oh, yeah. I mean, you I, drive I, him on the Mavericks, the Mavericks win it all. I mean, there's he right, he can right. still help somebody win. There's other places. There's other places. if the Heat can places. find a way. That's the move, right? I don't know. I don't see how Phoenix can do it without Devin Booker being in the package. And if you're getting rid of Booker, what's the point? Right? Um, that's why he would be going there. Right. That's <laughs> the point of going there. I think Toronto sounds cool because it's a great city. I love that city. And they could actually make it work. And they could make it work. So Toronto could do it. I just don't know if they will. And they have a really, really smart GM, though. Yep. So he's not he's not prone to getting okie doke. So I don't. I just don't know where that option is. I think once you dis well, once we talk about what we're going to talk about later, Durant ends up staying in Brooklyn. I think your move with Durant is get Ben Simmons in, um, uh, find a way to extricate yourself from he who shall not be named, and like that deal with the Pistons. Get the Pistons involved. Where there you he, go. He, he goes That's to the all these teams. Get the Pistons right. involved. <laughs> right. Exactly. Get the Pistons involved. He can go to the Lakers. Westbrook can get the buyout from the Pistons. You freed up your headache. Your money situation is okay. And you can probably get Noel and Burks in the deal. Or maybe Kelly Olenek. We'll give you all three of them. You can work out something where you can get some players that can help with Katie. That's what I would do. It works in the trade machine. I've seen it. I've done it. I went in the trade machine. Kelly Olenek, Nerlens Noel, and Alec Burke go to Brooklyn. He who shall not be named goes to the Lakers. And Westbrook and two draft picks go to the Pistons. You need to one 800 dollar piston. There you go. I'll make it work. If you want to make this happen, just let me know. But to answer your question, uh, he's not right. Bob Myers is wrong in this. I don't even know if it's Bob Myers. I just really like saying that. Um, he can go their teams. If Miami pulls it off, he can go there. But the Bam out of bio piece is tough because if I'm Brooklyn, I don't know what I'm, I'm – I'm not giving away Kevin Durant. Sorry. Uh, Toronto can make it happen. If Dallas could make it happen and not lose Luka – you tell me you're like Dallas with Luca and KD can win a title. I would disagree with you, Bob Myers. So, so, so I don't, I mean, I get why he's saying it. There's a point to it, but I disagree because there, there are a handful of other teams that have both the, 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 the weapons to get it done, the cap flexibility that can make them contenders that can make them contenders. So do you think that, KD wants away from the Nets, or does he want away from Flat Earth? This is Bills. This is Bills, boy. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm gonna give it to you first, you and, then, first. and okay, then I'm because I know because I, I know Bills got something for us. So I'm gonna right. let you get yours off. First. I'm gonna be quick because I want all of Bill's smoke. I don't want to miss out on any of Bill's smoke about World B Flat. It's easy. He wants away from World B. He came there with this dude in this band of brothers. We're gonna do whatever we have to do to get a title. Bullshit. And then this dude started missing games for, and I would never disrespect anyone with a legitimate mental health issue. I need a break kind of thing. Okay. Refusing to get a shot is just bullshit. You're never going to get me to buy that. That has something to do with your rights or your freedoms or anything. You got a job, bro. You got to go to work. You got to go to work. And you didn't go to work. You chose not to go to work. And this dude came to Brooklyn on the strength of your word that we are going to do this. We are going to make this happen. That's why KD signed with Brooklyn. So no matter what he'll ever say in public, because he's probably too good a dude to do it the way I'm doing it here, 
he got okie doke. He got bamboozled. He got hoodwinked. He got every Malcolm X saying possible. He got led astray. He got all of those by flat earth. So now he's like, uh-uh, I'm done with that dude. He's he's as kindly and as politely as he possibly can saying, can't play with that dude anymore. Won't do it. He went Mike Singletary. Can't do it. Can't win with him. Won't play with him. Won't do it. <laughs> Right, that's what I'm telling you. I'm conjuring up everybody tonight. Right? That was a great press conference, though. But I, I think he's saying, I don't want to play with that guy anymore. Bill Kyrie Irving signed a deal a few years ago that pays him four million for four years. Sorry, a guaranteed 136 million, 490,600 dollars. Guaranteed, wow, guaranteed, right? Annual, sorry. 34 million, 122,650. I mean, I know that you were recently chastising Brittany Grider for not knowing if she could live or not on almost a million dollars, right? Just so you know, Kyrie Irving, that, that's like what he, that's what he tips the guy who, who like details his car. Right. Um, his base salary next year will be 36 million, 503,300, dollars right? He is a, a cap hit of $36,934,550. So he is an incredibly expensive mistake. Understand that. Now, while it doesn't cost Kevin Durant any of this money, he's not paying any of that money, but it's costing him in other ways. As we talk about all these players, these are players who are still in their prime, but they're on the back side of their prime. You're still in your prime at 30, 31, 32, but you're closer to the end of your prime than you are to the beginning of your prime. I think we'd all agree to that. And Kevin Durant really, we've talked about this. He cares about what people say. He likes to say he doesn't, but he clearly yeah. cares about what people say about him. He really, really cares about what people say, James. And if he doesn't win another title someplace else, He's going to hear about it until he dies. Yep. yep. Until he, until they, it'll be something while they're memorializing him and talking about a great player was somebody will mention somewhere during the ceremony, you know, he never won another title after. I mean, like he won't be able to escape that. He's got to go someplace where he can win a title or he'll not have to go to state. Yeah. Someplace not called Golden right, State. All right. Every, Every place not named Golden State, and obviously the team is leaving now. Um, or or if they get the other guy to leave, he can stay, right? <laughs> That's the other – those are the two options. Either I can go someplace else or I can stay and get rid of this guy. So I think the Nets would prefer to have him stay and get rid of the other guy. Yeah. Uh, and as was mentioned, they may be calling the Pistons, which apparently is solving everyone's problems tonight, <laughs> uh, which is awesome. Why they come to dial the Pistons? <laughs> we take care of everybody. Yeah. You got a bunch of bad contracts or bad attitudes on your team? Call the Pistons. <laughs> we, we take those calls. Oh, that's awesome. That, that's a service that apparently a few teams need. So Detroit, we good on you, Detroit. Uh, but, yes, they may be in Didn't deep Mako, down didn't the Mako start in Detroit? Yes, sir. Frighteningly, <laughs> though, the best situation is for Flatter to go away, for him to stay in New Jersey, Give Sean Marks an opportunity to add a couple pieces. That's his best shot. It's to stay stay in Brooklyn. Yes. I still oh, call yeah. them New Jersey. I still call the Chargers San Diego. So if I just did that, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I might have done it. But stay in Brooklyn. While we're at it, let's put him back in the ABA. <laughs> exactly. But, yes, I mean, short of finding, once again, I guess involving the Pistons, uh, as you said, if they could somehow make that work, uh, they can they can keep Kevin Durant and build around him. He's the kind of player you can build around and win. I, I, anyone who says otherwise, somebody doesn't like Kevin Durant, and they're just trying to take take that out on you know him. Yeah, but he, they've got some side issue, yeah. Right, right, right. But he's a top five player and has been one for a while. I mean, I don't think that's even really to me. It's not even debatable. Not debatable. No, not debatable to me. And uh, you know he's. I mean, we can talk about clutch gene and all that silly stuff that people like to talk about on debate shows. But if you're saying, I have my choice of any team, any players in the league, and assuming LeBron is gone, and I don't know who else. I mean, there's not too many yeah. others. Um, Giannis, maybe. Giannis, maybe, maybe Steph. I mean, I'm still iffy on that no, one. My, my list goes Giannis one, 
Right. LeBron and Durant's probably three. I love yeah, Durant. Yeah, right. So Durant's right. I'm with you. And I'm willing to bet if we were to, to talk to every GM in the league, the, the range is two to four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, That's probably it. has him lower than that. It isn't. Got to be top five. Two to four feels more realistic. Two to four feels about right. So say what you want about anything else. He's a player that anybody who cares about winning basketball wants. Right. And the team that has him right now wants him. Uh, and they need to figure some stuff out. So once again, do, 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 do. Uh, it may indeed be, be trying to get that fixed. 313 is the area code, by the way. <laughs> okay, now you guys have made some interesting points here, but you know, there, there's some things that I keep thinking about, you know, from okay. when LeBron and Kyrie were together in Cleveland. And all of a sudden, Kyrie wants to be his old man. And now, you know, I got to get out of Cleveland. Okay. Now, after last year's debacle with Russ, do you really want to bring Kyrie to the Lakers? Do I? I'm not a Laker fan, so hell yeah. I have fun. It's going to be entertaining as hell, and it's going to blow up the Lakers. I want it more than anybody on the planet. Nobody wants this more than me. <laughs> yeah, I want it. <laughs> because you're right. If you think about it, there's this cool, and I got to give somebody credit. Somebody on the four-letter did a thing, and it was very subtle. But they talked about pictures of the Kyrie that won a title with LeBron. He had a clean haircut. He looked like a young man. Yeah. Now, bro's got gray in his beard. He's got gray in his hair. He looks like <clears throat> Bill Cosby circa Uptown Saturday Night, like 1974 or something like that. Right. He's, and he's so, aged a little faster than he aged really quick. And like yeah. he aged like a decade in four years or something. <laughs> it's crazy. He and that's what I think he did it on purpose. I think he wants that. Um, but you guys know I don't I don't want to do my rant. You guys know how I feel about him. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I, I can't stand that dude. I'm gonna pass on that. <laughs> throw, 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 at least throwing a, a a a life raft uh, out there, Bill. No. <laughs> <laughs> I will think about this for a second. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I, I think we. I mean, we are as a group. We've talked about this dude enough. I feel comfortable that I know how Bill feels about it. I I think that. Bill has slightly more composure than me. My reaction to that dude comes off very viscerally. I don't. I think he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. I think he's selfish. I think he's arrogant. I'm not sure he's a good human being. I'm just not. I'm not. I think Giannis is a great guy. I have grown to like LeBron James. As a Piston fan, there was a time where I couldn't foresee that happening. But I can't say anything bad about LeBron right now. The truth is, he has carried himself well. He's taken care of his body. He has parlayed his celebrity to help the world. He's a good yes. businessman. I actually would rather sit here and wax nostalgic about my love for LeBron, even though he put up like 40 points in a quarter against the Pistons once. I don't even go back to that nightmare. I like LeBron. The only thing I wouldn't like about that dude going to the Lakers is it would ruin the, the end of LeBron. Oh, my God. That would be my only downside because I've grown to like LeBron. And for me to say I really like LeBron and then say I dislike you, that's it in a nutshell. LeBron used to be the enemy. And – and. I, I don't know. I have nothing good to say about him. He's, nope. Is he a talented basketball player? Yep. It's a million of those dudes. There's a dude in Rucker who's super talented. Doesn't mean yes. he's a good person. Doesn't mean he cares about other people. Doesn't mean he's a good teammate, loyal human being. None of that stuff. That dude's about himself. He's always been about himself. When he stood in Boston Garden and said, if you will have me, I was like, this motherfucker. <laughs> I was done with him that day. Right? He sat there and he did that self-effacing if you guys are having me, I'd like to finish my career here. It wasn't 14 months later, he <laughs> bounced. He's so disingenuous and fake and smart. As I did it anyway. You guys got me to do it anyway. I'm saying, <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do it, and you got me to do it anyway. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Nope, nope. I'm done. I keep wanting to see the Sith Lord version of you, where the hate just flows out. It's and electricity. Up. 
Electricity like, comes from your fingertips. Exactly. I feel like there's a light emanating from me now. A group of lasers. And they're all starting to formulate in one direction. And they're just looking for a picture of Kyrie. They're looking for the name Kyrie. They're searching. And it's a sonar guy on a sub somewhere going, we haven't locked on a signal yet. And I'm just building up. I'm building up. Uh, all right, I'm way off, Jared. Sorry. Go ahead. So if you literally do not care at all about team chemistry, because that's what you first have to start with, have no interest at all in team chemistry. Let's just say you have no interest at all in team chemistry. That's the first thing you got to start with. If you have even the slightest shred, a scintilla of interest in team chemistry, you don't pick up that phone. You don't take that call. You don't. You don't. You don't. You leave that text on on unread, yep. right? You yep. you block the number of his agent. You do not even consider it if you care even a little bit. If a, if, if if there's the concern of a mustard seed of team chemistry somewhere in your heart, that's a no. It's a big fat no, James. No. He started statement with. If you don't care about team chemistry, full stop, full stop for me. And everything he said after that was great. That Bill started his whole statement off with, if you don't care about team chemistry, yeah, Kyrie's a great idea. <laughs> Bill, uh, Mr. Harden decided that uh, he was going to take one for the team. <laughs> Okay, but let me but, but 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 Bill, <laughs> is, is is an old PJ Tucker the answer? <laughs> you know, well, what's the you, question? You, if PJ Tucker's the answer. You got to tell me the question. <laughs> but the, the the question is, do you give up money to get an old PJ Tucker? I mean, I like PJ Tucker because you know my love for glue guys, and, <laughs> and, then, and literally. If you look up Glue Guy in the dictionary, there is a picture of PJ Tucker. Right? PJ Tucker. Yep. I mean, I'm sure his mother would, like felt him. He was a little sticky when he was born. I'm sure <laughs> he was probably born a little gluey. Um, I, I mean, I have a certain amount of love and respect for PJ Tucker and all the PJ Tuckers out there. Um, but I mean, you. <sighs> That's not the linchpin. You're like, that's not your, hey, we got PJ Tucker. Like, that's not how you, once again, we talk the press conferences. Like, you don't open the press conferences. Hey, we got PJ. Like, that's not, how do you know? Um, like, it's cool to have PJ Tucker, right? Like, oh, man, like, that's awesome. We got PJ Tucker. PJ Tucker. You can't, like, that's not something you, like, that's not in the, in the press guide. When you open the press guide, if PJ Tucker's in the first few pages, something's wrong. Something's right. desperately yeah. wrong. PJ Tucker is going to be page 37 of your, like, oh, oh, here it is, like, right before the ad for the fix a flat. Uh, right, right where you get to <laughs> that ad. There, he's, going over more. he's killing PJ Tucker. <laughs> I like PJ Tucker. I'm not killing him. I like, fix I a flat. Do they, do they, I haven't heard, do they make fix a flat? Anymore? Fix a flat. <laughs> well, he dropped <laughs> fix a flat. Yeah. On PJ oh, yeah. but that's, who, that's who sponsors the PJ Tucker page of your, of your media. <laughs> the PJ Tucker page is powered by fix a flat. So it's it sponsored by Fix and Flat. Powered by Fix and Flat. PJ Tucker Page, powered by Fix and Flat. Um, like that's cool. Like I like PJ Tucker, but like I, I can't believe I was. I, I made sure that I was thinking of the right thing when I saw him pop up in the in like the rundown. Like PJ Tucker. Okay. Like oh okay. I'll entertain it. I'll I'll allow it. We're gonna talk about PJ Tucker. Well, let's get into it. Um. I mean, I don't. I would never turn down if I if I'm running a team and I can get PJ Tucker. I'm not turning down the opportunity. I want to make that clear. But like, that's not something. That's not in the strategic meetings. We don't say how do we get PJ Tucker. Like that's not something that comes up. We're putting together our plan for the season. Like it, it shouldn't. I'll put it that way. It should not. If you spin, if you open up, like, hey guys, I hope you had a great summer. We're back. We gotta talk to PJ Tucker. Like, if, like, is that what we're doing now, James? Like, 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 you break out the whiteboard and you like circle in the big circles as PJ Tucker. Is that how you're opening the meeting? Like, you have a a, a PowerPoint presentation. And I'm it's coming like, to PJ's rescue. I'm coming to PJ Tucker's rescue. <laughs> Here's the thing: it's not just PJ Tucker. It can't just be PJ Tucker because Bill's 100 percent right. 
I don't want to pile on. No, I absolutely want to pile on. I just don't know if I can beat fix and flat. So I'm going to go a different, <laughs> I'm gonna go a different direction. I think James Harden took less money because he trusts Daryl Morey. That is a statement about his confidence in Daryl Morey. P.J. Tucker is the first move. Daryl yeah. Morey's time is February. Trade deadline, Daryl Morey is not going to sit still. P.J. Tucker is one move. They're going to assess where they are, see how things are going. Daryl Morey will make a move in February. If they're in the right place, if Embiid's healthy, and they're doing what they should be doing, he'll go and do another move. P.J. Tucker's not the reason Harden takes less money. He takes less money because he trusts Daryl Morey. If that's how they sold him for <laughs> taking less money, I would, I would literally give you 50 bucks to be in the room to hear that one. Right. That, that that's not how it happened. The American dollars. Yeah. If so I, think, I could I hear the room the beginning. where they pitched him on restructuring his deal so it get P.J. Tucker. Okay, James, I just got off the phone. Are you sitting down? If you're willing – to restructure your deal, we could get P.J. Tucker. <laughs> That's right. I said P.J. Tucker. And let's be let's be clear. Harden grabbed sixty eight million dollars on a two year deal. He didn't just like like put his family in the poorhouse. We took less money. He got thirty four scratch bird. He's fine. And so yeah, yeah, he's not hurting. He's not hurting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, th this is the thing that, you know, like I said, kind of bugs you when people are talking about, well, you know, uh, he left $14 million on the table. Well, <laughs> you know, well, what did he take off the table? Right, exactly. <laughs> Maybe that table <laughs> couldn't even help another $14 million. Yeah, all yeah. The money got, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, so, you know, uh, it, 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 I'm not going it, to, it's not a day for me to, you know, like talk about the capitalist system, but, you know, there are a lot of people that do very good in it, you know. Right. That, we can that, do that, that, that as it that, relates that, to sports, and I'd love to do it because I'd yeah. probably surprise you. I don't think there's an overpaid athlete in any sport in America, and I'd love to do that show sometime. Some, yeah, a lot of them are underpaid. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we could definitely do that, you know. I, and love and it. I could play the devil's advocate yeah, on, yeah, we on that on. one. I, I really love that one, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, especially now that they got the, this little NIL involved that we'll talk about a little. Oh yeah, little, oh yeah, little NIL. Later. Is a great <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, let's let's uh, keep on going here. Let's let's uh, move on to uh, some college football, uh, and uh, the guy whose school shall not be named uh, is not here yet. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I, I, I'll see whether or not he wants to, yeah, to break. We, you we know, don't show up. We don't talk about his school. <laughs> That's the rules. And, but uh, you guys got uh, a, a guy through the portal, I believe. Uh, that's uh, on the. Uh, uh, oh, look who's here! Here comes Chris. Here comes Chris. Oh, we Speaking got Kendrick. That. We got Kendrick in the house. Uh, what's up, guys? Did you How find you somewhere to get some lunch in Hartford? Uh, yeah. He's, how do you know what are you stalking me today, Demetrius? <laughs> no, no, I stalk you every day, bro. Oh yeah, you saw. Uh, so yeah, that's that's something coming soon. I was looking for uh, the best chicken tender spot. So yeah. I'm working on. I, I caught content. a tweet. Yeah, I caught a tweet where he was looking for a chicken spot in Hartford. Yeah. Not, so, I, I don't know the time well enough. I couldn't say anything, but I was well, wondering if he found something. Once I'm in your neck of the woods, you can. I'm sure you can tell me a good spot to go. So oh, I'm working on. Spot. There's spots, yeah. You Let's come see, up here. There's a Chick fil A right off I 95. No, no, no. <laughs> but uh, how you doing tonight, Chris? How's I'm everything? Good, guys. Glad to, glad to be back. It's been a busy schedule here lately. I actually just finished recording a podcast tonight. So um, I'm glad to be back with uh, you fellas tonight. So didn't want to interrupt the conversation. I don't know if Bill is in the middle of something or not. And no, no. Well, you uh, missed you, you, you might know. Bill still got plenty of time. He has and, dropped some gems already. Nice. You you missed him drop a flat tire advertisement on the head of PJ Tucker for no apparent reason. An unprovoked attack on PJ Tucker. That was amazing. So yeah, he's in he's in form. He's in form. Yeah. So I mean, Chris, I, I, I'm gonna ask you that question. Uh, you know, uh, everyone's talking about uh, you know the the pay cut that James Harden took. And, uh, you know, how Bill always talks about those glue guys, you know. So 
how, what's your reaction to Harden taking a pay cut? And presumably part of that taking that pay cut was acquiring PJ Tucker. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, when I had one of my guys on the podcast to talk NBA, he's like, yeah, I mean, the only reason PJ Tucker has a job in the NBA is to guard Giannis and KD and uh, Jason Tatum. I mean, those, that's pretty much the reason he gets paid what he gets paid. Uh, if Tatum wants, or if uh, um, James Harden wants to say he's taking a pay cut to help out a guy like PJ Tucker, then, you know, it is what it is. Then I'm sure PJ Tucker appreciates that so he can just rack up some more shoes because I know he's the biggest shoe head. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, I think, you know, P.J. Tucker does serve a role. I don't know if it's a glue guy, but I know he does definitely serve a role in the NBA. And, you know, he's he definitely got a contract that, you know, shows that he's he's useful still. Cash and checks. P.J. Yeah. Tucker's yeah. cash and checks. That's it. Cash and checks. And he's giving you seven and a half, five and a half, and one and a half night after night. But if the world <laughs> thinks you can guard Gian- Giannis and KD, that's it, bro. You can cash checks for a while. You can cash at 38. They think you can guard Giannis, which I think it's absurd nonsense. But I get why people think it, because nobody can, and he did the best job in a small sample. Right. Small sample. He did, well small sample size. he did a good job. So, all right, we'll go with it. Well, let's talk about the beard. Does anybody fear the beard anymore? I mean, you know, is it, you know, we talked about fix a flat with, with uh, you know, uh, PJ. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so you know, uh, are we going? Uh, uh, what, what, what's, what's the fifteen-minute loop with with, oh, uh, with, with, with with James Harden? I mean, no, well, no. James Harden has accomplished too much to right. be hidden in the back of the ad, right? Correct. James Harden's on the cover. He's on the He's cover on the of the team guide or whatever the hell that thing's called. And Embiid is on the cover. No, no, they're both on the cover. You okay. you don't put one dude on the cover. Well, uh, okay. you know, he's sitting, hard and sitting, maybe in a rocking chair. He's on the cover. I'm just <laughs> okay. saying. But you have to my fear the beard. No, fear the beard days are over because um, he was always ball dominant, volume score. And teams have figured out how you neutralize ball dominant guys. You forced them away from their strength. You forced them to take bad shots, get into bad passing lanes, and then you don't let other guys beat you. So yeah. you can play a game where James Harden in his prime could put up 52 and you win the game. They, they lose. And team once teams figure that out, you can't dribble out 20 seconds at the top of the key, break down some dude and throw up a bad shot. And that's what he became. So, so at this point in his career, the, the word fear doesn't enter, right? He still has a lot of things he can do. Yep. He, he, he will never again, well, maybe. He should never again be the best player on his team. He shouldn't be an option one. He's a really good option two now. Phenomenal option three. That's how you have to view him. So fear doesn't work into this anymore. He's not the dude that you game plan and have a special, you know, walk through to defend. Not anymore. Those days are gone. Bill? Well, I'm in that situation where it's like, what that guy just said. Um, <laughs> but here, I'll, I guess I will agree and extend, as we say in uh, in product. Now you must agree and extend. Yeah. Uh, so to agree, I've been saying for how many years I've been on the show now, James? Oh man, let's see, two thousand. Yeah, at least, yeah, five, six, somewhere in that range. Yeah. And and right around the time I came on the show, people were starting to talk about him as one of the best players in the league, and I said no. <laughs> Do you remember why I said no, James? All those years ago, dribble. 20 seconds, <laughs> ball down. And, on, and, like that. Yeah. and the fact that at the other end of the court, unlike even a guy like, like Steph Curry, who's a very much below average defender, but at least gives you what he's got. He reads passing lanes. He gets his hands on balls. He averaged something like 2.25 steals per game for his career. Even though he's not a good defender, he at least gives you something. Yeah, yeah. I don't even get that from Hart, right? I don't get the – nuisance factor on defense even for him. So when you combine the, as you said, dribble the ball for 20 seconds, and then now something happens right. with the – I mean, he gives you nothing on defense, James. Not a single solitary thing. He doesn't create difficult shots for the person he's defending. He doesn't create turnovers. 
he, he's not a weak side defender. Like, what's the thing I'm supposed to? What I, I might as well literally have him just sit up, sit, like get a little folding chair and sit and wait for the ball to come back to the other end of the court. That's got to be a folding chair, man. Can you get a pad or something? That dude, <laughs> <laughs> folding chair. <laughs> you know, the ones that your uncles take to the picnic. You know I know what the ones you're talking about. Yeah. I have one in my garage. I, yeah. right. But that's perfect for him because – cup holders in the – Yes, in with the, the cup holders. Of course with the cup holders. <laughs> and you can also put ones in there to throw at people. So you, you have – this player that is one not fun to watch, but very effective at least in certain situations on offense. But as was pointed out, you can neutralize some of those things if you are a good defensive team, disciplined, and you stick to your plan. Will he occasionally hit a "Oh my God, I can't believe you hit that shot"? No matter what you do, yes, because he's James Harden. But can you live with that? Yes. And combine that with the fact that he's a he's a decent playmaker, he's a good good passer, but he does nothing else other than shoot and pass at even an average level. He's a, I mean, he's not super athletic, so he's a slightly below average rebounder. Um, and he's nothing on defense. Absolutely nothing. Null. So you don't like that 0. 0.2 block shot game? <laughs> right. I mean, that's not, that's not good. I'm not doing anything for you. Like when you look, it's like if you, if you put in your, you know, like you look up, you know, defensive highlights, James Harden, you get like the, 404, 404 error message. Error, error <laughs> four. I mean, like it's. Do you mean James Harden <laughs> grilling? <laughs> well, I mean, Chris, Chris you kicks your back. Like, what the hell's wrong with you? So, Chris, I, I said this years ago, Dan. Years ago, and I haven't come off it. I said then that I told you how many years ago a team built around James Harden would never win a title. I said that six years ago, James. I've never changed. But, the, but the key to what you said is built around. Built around, yes. Yeah, yeah. He, he can be on a championship team. No, oh, of course he can be on a championship team. I said a team built around if him. He, if he went to the Celtics right now, whoo. <laughs> yeah, Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I, I, I know we can get Chris talking <laughs> now. I mean, <laughs> this this two-year two deal that he signed is just two more years where he's not going to touch a championship. I don't see it. So James Harden's you know, just going to cash checks for a couple more years, do what he's doing, and then maybe two years from now he'll decide – Hey, I'll take a couple mil and maybe get on a, a contender and finally get a ring. You exactly. know, if that's his kind of game plan, that he can do that. And you know, we've so we slowly watched the decline of James Harden for, like Bill said, the last five years or so, and it's just gotten to this point where he's still deciding that he'd rather get the checks over the rings. Um, so we'll see kind of when he hits that crossroads. But I predict after this two-year contract's up, he'll. Yeah. He'll finally get there and decide he pay a time I can championship to kind of maybe solidify myself as that player that I was for the past, you know, 10, 12 years and, you know, doorstep of, you know, Hall of Fame talk. We'll see. But I just with his you know ability to score, but he definitely needs a ring on his resume. So we'll see what he wants to do two years from now. He, he just Chris just nailed it. He's going to cash his 68 million over two years. Then he's going to take a mid-level exception and come to Detroit. And the 24, 25 Pistons are going to deliver that ring, baby. That's the I, point. I'm going to put it out right now. He ends up back on the Thunder in two years. I think you're right. That would be hilarious. That's, that's actually not absurd at all. <laughs> that's not absurd they'll, they'll, at all. They'll be, they'll be primed to add a guy like James Harden. Yep. And we already talked to my podcast today about how they might be exceeding what they're planning to do because we all expected them to be in for Victor Wembanyama, And with the team they put together already, they might knock themselves out of even being a top five pick next year. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're still building well. And, you know, two years from now, maybe they want to bring a James Harden in to try to add well, they got scoring off the bench. 117 draft picks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, does uh, Kevin want out of New York or does he want away from Kyrie? Yeah, I feel like we've talked about this one to death at this point. I think he, he wants both at this point, but I don't think he's going to get either. Uh, it's just it's played out too much where. We've seen what the cost was for a guy like Rudy Gobert, and that sets such a high bar <laughs> that no one's going to be able to match that for a guy like Kevin Durant. You know, you're sacrificing probably a decade's worth of draft picks to get Kevin Durant on your team for the back nine of his career, and you know, no team's really going to sacrifice that. Even though everyone would love to have Kevin Durant on their team, I'd love to have him on the Celtics, but they talked about a deal that would involve like Jalen Brown, Derek White. Um, 
a whole bunch of picks. I'm like, this isn't anything I want to be associated with. Like, I, I like Kevin Durant. This isn't anything I want to be associated with. I, I, don't want, I don't want an aging Kevin Durant. <laughs> He's passed a couple injuries. He's been disgruntled lately. Like, I, I don't want that Kevin Durant. That's you know, such it, an effective <laughs> statement. Yeah, this is and nothing I want to be associated with. Like, yeah, and, and, and it's unfortunate for him because now that bar's been set so high that he's not going to be able to get out of Brooklyn. And he can maybe talk to ownership and try to be like, hey, guys, can you just at least cut Kyrie bit loose for something? <laughs> you know, get me. I, I don't know what the That's not this topic. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. But I think he's between a rock and a hard place right now. Make, make mandatory, make flying mandatory. Maybe that'll do it. Uh, Chris, uh, let's talk a little college football here. Uh, the Las Vegas sport books have already picked USC to win the, the, the playoffs. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, that's interesting when I saw that on the topic sheet because, I mean, I'm not a huge college football guy, but um, I'm surprised to see them at the top there. I mean, they, they, of course, brought in Lincoln Riley. So he's got a new coach there, and they're moving to, you know, they're going to start setting up for their move to the Big Ten. So they have a lot of expectations this year, but I feel like USC has always been that perennial team that, you know, is has high expectations and just doesn't fulfill them. So I'm sure that's nice looking at USC right now, but I'll probably take some other teams in the field to win the championship this year. Bill, I'm a you huge fan of all these guys. Yeah, I do. I'm a huge USC fan, but I'm also a realist. Nine and three, they're a year away. I mean, eight and four, nine and three, but they're a year away. Uh, they're going to get more impact transfers because they're going to have some big television games. They're going to look good. And I mean, if you like NIL money, I would like to point out that USC is in Los Angeles. They have. I could spend the rest of the night naming famous alumni, uh, and many of them are more than willing to. What's the term they use? Kid, the kids use break you off. Uh, more than more, so. So when you add, and if you've been on USC's campus, I mean, it was an easy place to recruit to long before money got in. Well, okay, money was involved even then, but you know what I mean. Like openly, money was involved. Now you add that if any young person has any aspirations to somehow be connected to the entertainment industry, oh, hey, look, it's Will Ferrell. Oh, Snoop Dogg's back at practice. Like, think of it. And now you have a winner, because they do have a, a winning program. They will have a winning program again. Uh, Lincoln Riley is going to win. He's going to win a decent amount this year. He's going to win a whole lot more next year. And I don't think they win it all next year, but I think they are – in the playoffs, not this year, but next. And then they could potentially win it all in 2024, five, five, 25. I think they're legitimate. They're three years away from being a legitimate contender to win everything. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Demetrius, uh, the SEC commissioner says that there's no sense of urgency to expand beyond 16 teams. What's your thoughts on that? <laughs> Uh, so, so, um, uh, until the Big Ten makes an announcement that they've got Oregon and Stanford and Washington and maybe Notre Dame, then uh, that's when it is. When when a leader stands up in a room and says no sense of urgency, that means there's a meeting that happened yesterday and it damn well is a sense of urgency. They're planning. They're strategizing. This is a chess game. That's what this is. And I love it. I'm here for it. Not just because I'm a Big Ten guy. I love it. I can't wait until we just got two mega conferences and yep. we got the AFC and the NFC because that's what it's going to be. And the, <laughs> and the Big Ten West is going to be USC. We'll, we'll grab Arizona or Arizona State if they want to come. We need to get Oregon and Washington. Those are the two I want. We'll take Stanford if they want to get in. Um, we're going to have a, a Big Ten West. We're going to have a Mid-Central with your Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota types. We're going to have the better division, wherever they put Michigan State, and then we'll put Rutgers and Penn State in some Eastern division. That'll be the AFC or the NFC, whatever you want to call it. I don't know why we're being so slow. I don't know why we're being resistant. I don't know why anybody's acting like this isn't happening right in front of I feel like I said this like eight months ago, by the way, on this very podcast. I'm, I, you know, he has to say that because he wants to act like, oh, we're the SEC, and I get it. You're the SEC. 
you know, you guys like cornbread and pinto beans, whatever. It's all good. You guys don't change for nobody. The minute the Big Ten makes the next the next move, and the domino is Notre Dame, as much as I hate to admit it, Notre Dame's a domino. If Notre Dame makes an announcement is that we're down with the Big Ten, there'll be a sense of urgency then. They'll meet a meeting then, and they'll be calling Clemson, South Carolina. They'll be calling Tallahassee. They'll be calling Miami because that, that's their gems. They need to go get those three. Just like the Big Ten needs to get Notre Dame. I'm going to say Oregon and Washington are the ones I really like. Because uh, footprint-wise, media, think about the Big Ten, think about the SEC. SEC got some powers. Think about media market. Big Ten's got L.A. Big Ten's got Chicago. Big Ten's got Detroit. Big Ten, in theory, has New York, right? Big Ten, in theory, has Philly. Uh, Big Ten has the markets, if that's what this really is. But if we still want to talk about old school football and the hedges and swamps and all that shit, cool. You guys can have all that. We're just going to gobble up the top seven or eight media markets in the country and get the bread. Get the bread. That's the Big, Big Ten is trying to hide anything. Big Ten is, is, is scratching off dollars. Right, because Bill used the term earlier, break them off. You know how you can break them off more when you got those markets. And as much as I don't talk about that other school, they got one of the biggest fan bases in the country. They're all over the world and they break off that money. And Ohio State will break off that money. If that's what we're doing, and it seems like I'm I'm like camp big ten, right? I am. I'll admit it. I love it. I want to take over the world. I want to dominate the SEC. I can't wait. I need there to be, and my school is doing great. We're not gonna talk about them maybe. <laughs> But that's okay. My school's doing just fine. Um, shorter answer to your question is he's full of crap. He's doing a PR game. He's trying to show we're not bothered face. If you're not bothered, you're not paying attention, bro. Big Ten is not joking anymore. The Big Ten reached to Los Angeles. <laughs> Think about what I'm talking about. There are two Big Ten schools in Los Angeles. Okay, I'm 53. This is craziness to me, but I'm I'm in. Young dudes like Chris with that sweet ass beard, he doesn't care where teams are. It care they call a conference. Like, I'm an old old. head. <laughs> What's that? I wish I was a lot younger than I look. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's working, bro. Don't worry about and, it. And, and all of us out here in California are talking about, you know, how three years ago Newsom is, hey, let's get these guys paid, and you know, we're taking advantage of college athletes. And now, hey, why are you guys leaving California? Why are you going to? There's about a billion reasons I can think of, but anyway, right. they're not leaving. They'll be there. They're yeah, there a better game. <laughs> when, when Michigan comes out and plays in Pasadena against UCLA, and on the same weekend USC is in Columbus, guess who's watching all those games? Everybody, <laughs> right? And Chris. that's what this ends up being about. You got some great matchups now. I can't wait for Michigan State to go out there, play in the Rose Bowl in the regular. I love it. Chris, you said you might uh, not be a big college fan, but what do you think about uh, these alignments, man? And you know, like, hey, I mean, you know, like, as, like, I mean, I I'm a college football guy. Like, I worked in college, but my team is Montana, and like, you know, I I just don't mess around in the the bowls yet. Hopefully, with all this realignment, then Montana maybe boosts up, and we can start. Oh, playing. the Mountain West has already got Montana on their booty call list. I know. And I, I'm <laughs> for it. We did be 21 ranked Washington last year, so you know we we put together a, qu- a squad out in Missoula. So don't don't sleep on the Grizz. But oh. um, this will definitely excite me more as a fan. I think too, maybe part of the, what the SEC commissioner is doing is a lot of these teams do have media deals, so some of them might have to wait a little bit here. So he might be eyeing some teams and. These teams might feel the pressure like, oh, we have to do this immediately to get down here. But he might be sending a signal like, hey, we got some time. Like, don't do what you got to do. Figure out how to get out of these deals so we can, you know, have smooth transitions. Um, I see, you know, that being a key cog in his decision making here is, you know, there are some media deals at risk. And, you know, some deals will have to be broken when teams are joining these new conferences. Um, So I think that might be part of the slow play as well. Bill, uh, Nick Saban, uh, he called. He's calling for uh, NIL regulations in order to save the competitive competitive balance. Because that's all that Nick Saban worries about is saving competitive balance. When he wakes up in the morning, James, the first thing he's thinking is, "How can I save competitive balance? I want these games to be compelling and exciting. I want to make sure that it goes down to the final." Every game possible goes down to the final possession. That's what Nick Saban wants. He's always been all about the even Steven, right? That's what you, if you know nothing else about Nick Saban, that's what he thinks about. 
making sure that everybody has a shot to win every game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he said save competitive. He, he believes there's competitive balance now, and he's trying to save it. Why? Because his team is at the top of the damn competitive balance mountain, kicking other people off. What he's so talking keep about the balance is, the way it is. Let's not shake it. Right. 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 Balance being right. The five of us that are always on top yeah. are balanced. The five of us feel good about this. We don't yeah. need anybody else. And it's him and Clemson, Clemson and Georgia and Ohio State and a couple other schools kicking everybody off. Get out, get out, trying to climb up to the top of this mountain. How dare he suggest there's actual balance to be saved? That's the most disingenuous thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Save competitive balance. That's all he worries about. That's what he's Demetrius every night before he goes to bed. Little Nikki Saban prays to God that <laughs> competitive balance can be restored and, and preserved. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. Well, there is no competitive balance. There's nothing to save. Yeah. Well, hold on, Demetrius. Now, see, you know, now, once again, I have to come to you and your knowledge here when it comes to the financial side and making sure that things go right for these young people. And, you know, I, I know you said earlier that it wasn't the job of the NFL or, or you know, uh, uh, some of these other people, but it should be, uh, it goes back to the parents and, and, and your circle. But, Lane Kiffin seems to have a, a different idea. Now, Lane says that coaches, he believes that coaches should be more involved in directing these funds combined with the salary cap. And that would help the current NIL issues. I don't see where he's going to try to, you know, like uh, share his, that, that bonus that he just got the other day with his assistant coaches, but I mean, you know, I'm just saying, uh, what, what you, what's your thoughts there? So, me? Yeah. Oh, oh, man. I, all right. I'm going to start slow. Uh, if there's a less disingenuous person in the world than Nick Saban, it's Lane Ephraim Kiffin. Um, who are you helping, Lane? You certainly aren't helping a student athlete. Now that they're getting money, you want to basically dictate how much they get and dole it out. Wait a minute. Isn't that how it's been forever? Now, you want control of the, the money the student-athletes get. Who gets what and how they get it? He's just talking about control. What NIL has done, especially to the weak-minded coach of a, of a program not in the top seven or eight that we always talk about, it has threatened their power. Some kid somewhere who's going to have a million-dollar NIL deal is going to tell Lane Kiffin to kick rocks, and then he's going to get in the portal and he's going to come to Michigan State. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he's going to do. <laughs> But it's it's a stripping of power. Lane Kiffin is saying NIL and other things, the portal first, NIL and the portal together, it is stripping away power from the coaches. And Lane Kiffin's a college football coach. He does not want his power stripped away. He will he will cloak this in some idea of maybe competitive balance or or I don't think it's broken. I am get the bread guy. I am get your money. Get all the bags you can get and then get another bag. I'm not the guy to bring this dumb argument to. I don't give a damn about Lane Kiffin. I post on my Twitter feed at Cornbread Pod every single day. I put up a picture of Mel Tucker every single day, a different picture, and it's called hashtag Mel Tucker every day. I've got pictures of Mel Tucker smoking cigars in his backyard. Why? Because I love Mel Tucker. And Mel Tucker has said, okay, if this is the game and I got to use the portal and I got to take pictures of kids and Lamborghinis in the middle of Spartan Stadium, damn right I'll do it. He's doing whatever it takes within the rules to win, right? Lane Kiffin does not want to be stripped of that power. And what's happening now in college sports is players have way more power, and it's scaring the hell out of dudes like Lane Kiffin. This is absurd. No, no, and no. hell no. You don't get to direct the funds. No. No, thank you. And the difference is, earlier we were talking about professionals. Now we're talking about collegiate athletics. It's like a big difference to me. But no, I, I disagree with everything Lane Kiffin said. It's about coaches trying to keep power. Nick Saban's comments are about coaches trying to keep power. It's all the same. They don't they don't want the kids to have any power. Bill. So as we mentioned earlier, as Nicholas Lou Saban Jr. gets ready to go to bed, he gets down on his knees and prays. And when he turns, who is to his left? But Lane Monty Kiffin, he's still praying. 
and they pray together to preserve this game where a bunch of young men literally destroy themselves sometimes, but sometimes don't destroy themselves, but at least exert themselves to the utmost level so that these men, these builders of men, right? These leaders of men, these program builders, right? <laughs> can, um, can shape and mold the lives of these young men who come to them unformed, right? Yeah. Right? This is the myth that has propelled college football since its earliest beginnings, right? That these builders of men, these, these generals, right? These, these leaders, these god kings of football are going to take these, you know, not all of them are from the ghetto or whatever. I mean, so they're from farm, you know, communities. They're from, the, they're from all over the place, right? I mean, it's programs we're talking about our national recruiters. They have kids from everywhere. But no matter who they are, they're coming to these men to be molded and shaped. Not to go to school and play football, but be molded and shaped, you see. And these, on some level, they believe this. I'm convinced they still believe this on some level, that that's what they do. Now, I would disagree with that. <laughs> what they do. Lane Kiffin thinks he's molding young men? Is that what you understand? Okay. At least a little bit, I think. He okay, does. Lane. Remember, he grew up. Right. I mean, he's never not been around coaching. Right. From his I mean, remember I told you how um, how um, how Anthony Leon Pops Jr. Tucker was born a little bit sticky because he was born to be a blue guy. <laughs> Lane Kiffin was born with that whistle and the stopwatch and the visor that came with him. Standard equipment upon birth. So he's known he was going to coach football from. The moment of his conception, right? I mean, he was born in the hospital that's on the campus at University of Nebraska when his dad was the linebackers coach there. Like he knows he knows nothing else. So while there is the sort of funny, disingenuous douchebag part of him, <laughs> right? I think we all are aware of that, but there's a part of him that still is that little bit of a true believer, right? A part of him still buys that. I think I think. I'm not trying to psychoanalyze, but you can't grow up the way he grew up and not buy it a little bit. But the the funny disingenuous douchebag part of him is, well, one is like the largest part, yes, but it's also the most interesting part of him, right? The, nobody wants to see Ben Schwartzwalder nowadays, right? Nobody wants to see old school football coaches. Saban's as close as it gets, and even he, I can find, you know, film of him doing the Dougie. You know, so clearly, I'm not. I wish I were joking. I'm not. I can send it to you. Um, oh, where, where, what? No. <laughs> there's, there's film out there of Saban doing the Dougie. I, 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 I'm not ashamed to admit that I watched it more than once. But the point is that even like Mitch Walter Walter would never do the Dougie. My point is that even the guys who we think of as old school aren't really that old school, right? Everyone has had to sort of keep up with the time. But some of these guys still kind of buy into the myth. But they don't buy into it 100%. But they buy into it some. And, yes, we're getting you ready for the NFL. I mean, yes. I mean, that's the biggest part of it for many of these programs. But some of them truly believe that they're out here shaping lives or whatever the heck it is. Um, I mean, I, I don't even dislike Lane Kiffin. I just understand Lane Kiffin, right? I've gotten to the point where I've gone through all the cycle of Lane Kiffin stuff. I, I really, like, disliked him intensely at one point. Then I kind of, sort of, kind of liked him. Um, and I saw that he kind of was in on the joke for a while because he retweeted, like, a Daniel Tosh video of Daniel Tosh doing Lane Kiffin because he thought it was funny or acted like he thought it was funny. Like, he, like I sort of came full circle on it. But now I realize who and what he is, right? He's, he has a funny, disingenuous douchebag who is the son of a lifer. I mean, my, once again, if you look up football lifer in a dictionary, there's his dad. Right there, right? I mean, the guy's never had another job. It is life, but coaching football. And I don't think Lane has either, unless it maybe worked at a Baskin Robbins one summer when he was in high school or something. But like these are two, he's he's a different kind of lifer because you know he does. I think Lane Kimmon does the Dougie unironically. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even think he does it. It's like, you know what I mean? I think he thinks he can do the Dougie. Um, I don't even think he's doing it just for the lulls. 
Uh, so he is that funny, disingenuous douchebag who thinks he's cooler than he really is. But, but yes, these guys, I think, a little bit believe the hype about themselves. A little bit. Right, we'll see. Uh, Demetrius, uh, you guys got to transfer uh, Mr. Uh, Broussard. Uh, tell us a little bit about his impact. Is, uh, is he going to be the next Ken Walker or what? Uh, he's a good player. Here's the problem. We got another transfer from Wisconsin named Jalen Berger. Who I, right, who I'm a little more high on. Right, he's so better. I think as a tandem, they're going to be great. I don't know that either one of them will get a disproportionate enough of carries to have a Kenneth Walker type of year. Kenneth Walker came in, and within two practices, everybody knew he was the workhorse. Yeah. And then You're looking at like 1,085 and 770, like that kind yeah, of – Yeah, 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 exactly. And and I, I like Jalen Jay Berg a little better myself. I do like this guy. I mean, he's a grad transfer from Colorado. He was a Pac-10 – Pac-12 player of the year two years ago, I want to say. And if uh, and Don I think Hayes was here. freshman of the year, his freshman year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a Dallas kid. I, I think he went to, um, where'd he go? Uh, Bishop Lynch, if I'm not mistaken. But this is a Dallas kid. Uh, I'm excited about the backfield room in general. Um, he's certainly a part of that because Michigan State historically has, has liked to have a workhorse, but having a one-two would be great. If something happens with Berger, I would have no problem with Broussard stepping in. I like that he's a, he's a candidate. I think he gives you a, a, a little bit of a different punch. So uh, being being on the Doak Walker list is cool. I happen to like Jalen Berger a little more. But in general, I'm excited about the running back room, period. So, yeah, I like them both. Uh, Bill, I'm coming to you because I have no idea how to pronounce this kid's name. I can spell it all right. But uh, uh, Dabo says he's looking for his quarterback. He DJ, come on, Bill, what's his oh, name? Oh, okay. So DJ Ungalele is a guy who is going to, I believe. Is he played a ukulele too? I mean, no, go ahead. Might be. I mean, sure. would be the right cultural reference, I guess. <laughs> if you did. Uh, or at least slack key guitar. Slack key guitar uh, officials <laughs> meet me after the show. But um, here's what I will say. Um, I believe he's going to have a bounce back season. I believe that he pressed like crazy last year. And I'll be honest, I think the talent was a little bit down. I mean, for Clemson, right, from what Clemson normally is. Uh, they still have a very good defense. They're going to have even better defense next year. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, they're going to be good on defense next year. Um, and they're going to be a defense and run dominant team a little bit more, but he's going to make some plays down the field. And he could also run himself a little bit. I mean, he's not, you know, Michael Vick or anything, but he can run. He's, he's more in the sort of um, – Young Ben mold when Ben would like break out and run or like one of those sort of you know big lumbery but not afraid. Now he should probably get more afraid, but he he runs around out there a little more than he probably should. But he's gonna you know they're gonna win some more games. Uh, Clemson is still Clemson and they're gonna be back. Like and he's gonna be part of why they're back. Yep. Yep. Uh, Chris uh, Bryce Young. Uh, he's making pretty good use of uh, his uh, NIL windfall. Uh, he makes sure every week he takes his offensive lineman out to dinner. What's your thoughts there, Chris? I think it's a smart move for Bryce Young. Um, I mean, especially going into his last year, and you know he's going to be making significantly larger checks after this. So, you know, taking care of those guys in front of you is a veteran move. We hear about all the NFL player, all the NFL quarterbacks, you know, doing that, leading by example quarterbacks i'd always hear about tom brady taking care of his guys so i'm sure it's you know a trend throughout the nfl um and you know it's good to see a guy like bryce young bringing that now down to the collegiate level and utilizing his nil money to you know benefit his guys that you know might not be receiving that type of nil money or be able to get these kind of gifts that he can provide for them so definitely a smart man and hopefully he's taking them out for steak dinners you know beef those boys up make sure they're uh you know keeping them upright well, he's in Alabama, so I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, maybe uh, they, they might not have heard of a lot of fat free dinners down there, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's keeping those big boys uh, big, like you say, keep him off his back. Uh, Chris, let's talk a little NFL here. Uh, Finn's quarterback, uh, or at least backup uh, right now, uh, Teddy Bridgewater says he's tired of football players trying to portray a tough guy image. 
A change says that players should think more about how kids perceive their actions. What's your thoughts on Teddy Bridgewater's thoughts? I mean, I can I can see where Teddy's coming from with his thoughts. I mean, you always kind of see, you know, once these guys sign contracts, it's like getting this, getting that. You know, they're on private jets, things of that nature. So I can kind of see where he's coming from. I think it's definitely, you know, in a veteran kind of thought for Teddy and the guy like, you know, he's been through the league through, he's been through, you know, horrendous injury to come back and be able to do that. But I, I definitely agree with him. It'd be nice to kind of seeing, you know, these guys, you know, utilizing and promoting other things other than, you know, what they're buying. Um, but I know some guys are doing that. So it's not like it's a thing that's not done. So I know um, I think Teddy's, you know, just kind of eyeing one thing, but I think, you know, he he's shining a light on it. It's not something that is ignored. I'd say in the NFL, um, I know I always hear stories about guys when they go back for their degree, they're always highlighting things of that nature. So um, I think it, you know, something that could be, you know, highlighted a little bit more, but it's definitely not ignored. I'd say. Uh, your thoughts on that, Demetrius? Um, I think that Teddy is one hundred percent right. That's my disclaimer right up front. From an accuracy standpoint, Teddy's one hundred percent right. But here's the thing, Ted: you're asking people to not be human, right? You're asking a group of people who, since they're four or five, have worked hard to be a part of a team, a part of a group in college, a part of a fraternity, a part of a brotherhood. What that requires, and I'm not great at this because <laughs> I'm very much a loner slash do my own thing kind of guy, <clears throat> but these people have to face what human beings face around doing what you need to do to be accepted, to be a part of the team too, right? And sometimes that requires you to extend yourself, go outside of yourself, or just flat out not be yourself. That's unfortunate. And that's why I mean by it's 100% right. Within that brotherhood, guys still, even at that age, fall, they succumb to peer pressure and things like that. And then they've got people in their personal lives who are telling them they have to be a certain way. He's asking people to overcome something that's just a human being thing. It's really not a football question. This is about when you come from some poor inner city deal, <clears throat> excuse me, it's okay to rise above. People don't often get that, particularly people that look like us. Don't They think, oh, I got to go back. I got to rep the hood. The guy who's on here wearing Detroit shirts every podcast never stops talking. Who doesn't even live in the city anymore? I don't live in my region anymore. But if you ask me where I'm from, I'm going to tell you where I'm from because that's part of who I am. But it's okay to try and be the best version of yourself. You don't have to try and like, uh, uh, it's just the idea of overcoming without losing yourself. And there's a human being thing, particularly with people that look like us, that if you try and move beyond what you are, you are trying to be better than others. You are trying to leave people behind. You are, and guys can't do that. In, in an environment where since they're seven or eight, all they want to do is be a part of the clique, be a part of the group, be a part of the club. You're asking them to rise above, be better than, than just that thing. And, and you have to be strong of mind to say, I am me. I'm going to be the best version of me. I'm not going to speak poor grammar. I'm going to wear a belt, <laughs> right? I'm going to do things and still be me, right? And that's a big challenge for a lot of people. And everybody doesn't face that challenge. And yeah. I'm going to wrap it up with how I started. Teddy's 100% right. There are guys out there doing this tough guy gangster act who don't have an ounce of gangster in them. I, I know what a real gangster looks like. I don't have a problem telling you I am not a gangster. I have zero gangster in me. None. I watch British TV shows in my off time. I have zero gangster in me. Okay? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you it's not gangster, right? <laughs> I hope you watch them like the, the old office stuff like that. I love that. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's okay. And that's okay. And if I lose quote unquote street cred, cool. I don't need street cred. I can call my son after this podcast and yuck it up for 15 minutes. My life is good. I'm good. So so it is guys trying to overcome something that's a it's not an NFL problem. That's a human being problem. That's a life problem. Uh, people struggling within themselves. Who am I? What am I? Am I better than what I used to be? That that's hard. And I'm not trying to sit here and say it's easy because I've dealt with it on many levels. It is tough. I'm just 53 now. Don't really give a damn what most people think about me. And so those guys are 24, 25. They got money. They got people pulling on them. That's hard. But Teddy's 100% right. 100%. Bill, what, what do you think, uh, Mr. Airborne Ranger, that probably knows the words to Othello? <laughs> I mean, I, I could give you literal, like, 
soliloquies from a fellow that's what you're after. <laughs> but, <laughs> Bill, that's not what he asked. That's not what he asked. want to show you one. So I will focus on the question at hand. Um, I've been studying Teddy Bridgewater since you know he was a teenager, and he's a fascinating thought without, right? Um, and yes, as you pointed out, he's you know he's faced his professional mortality before his 25th birthday. I mean, think about that, right? Uh, they weren't they weren't 100 percent sure he would be able to walk normally, right? Right? Forget football for a moment. They were like 50-50 at one point on him being, oh, here it comes, on him being able to walk away for a while there. So he's he has a different view of some of these things than not, not only a younger player, but a player who hasn't already sort of been to the mountaintop and seen into the promised land in terms of the fact that this is temporary, right? There's a whole bunch of your life left after this is over. And guys push that out of their minds because the minute you start thinking about retirement, you should retire, Right. The minute you start thinking about it, you're done. Yeah. So he's a, like I said, he's a, he's a, he's a deep thinker. He's a thoughtful guy. Uh, he, he, he deals with things differently from a lot of the guys in the league. Uh, that having been said, I mean, think about the, the supposed rift that took place in the, um, in the Seahawks locker room was supposedly in part because Russell Carrington Wilson was what a cornball, right? Yeah. I mean, literally that term was used. Um, and was to, you know, why it was that some people felt like he couldn't really lead the team because he's a quote unquote cornball. Think about that, right? Think about, <coughs> like, <clears throat> think about if that was a disqualifier in almost any other walk of life where it's like, yeah, we were going to hire you for the executive vice president uh, position, but turns <laughs> out you're a cornball. Your core bar quotient was too high. Um, we we went back and looked through your playlist. There was a lot of John Denver in there. So <laughs> we're going to go in a different direction. Like, think about this. Like, think about what's being said. This is a, Football teams are a multi, 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 multi-million, damn near a billion in some cases. In the case of the Cowboys, probably billion dollar, multi-billion dollar corporation. And the quarterback is in this weird sort of quasi- place where you're considered like you're not really management but you're not really labor either right they negotiate with you differently they talk to you differently you know your coaches play golf with you you know what i mean they don't play golf with most of the other guys but they play golf their quarterbacks right right i mean it's a it's a it's a weird sort of middle place between the the boys right the team and the men right because whether we admit it or not there's still a paternalism a little bit left in the way that football teams look at their, you know, the boys, right? Now, these boys can be 37 years old in some cases, and, but they still kind of think of them as not fully adults, right? The coaches are really adults, right? That's still the way some teams function to this day. So when you see these, this rift that builds up around, especially in, in, once again, our culture, around whether or not somebody is down, Right? Is he down? But is he down? Like it's something you only have to think about as a black person, right? You never have to like congratulations, Chris and Mike. You never have to ask yourself when you're meeting somebody, but is he down? Like that's not something you walk away thinking <laughs> after meeting somebody. Gosh, I see Chris is always down. Look at that beard. <laughs> we do have like the beard posse down here. I noticed you get in on a beard coach. Baseball caps and pots and, and beards apparently down in this section over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean it's it's, it's a struggle that only certain people will ever have to worry about. But, yes, he's right in calling, calling out certain things. And while I think it's a mistake for us to put so much of – I mean, yes, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that young people look up to you, blah, blah, blah. But we do also want to have a society where, God willing, our young people will realize that athletes should not be your role models. But that's, I guess, once again, another show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Charles Barkley told us that 20 years ago. He wasn't the first to say it either, but yes. Exactly. Uh, Mike, uh, is, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, as you can see, you oh, jumped okay. in on the very uh, first topic here uh, in our NFL. And we're talking about the Teddy Bridgewater's comments about uh, tough guys and that uh, uh, players should concentrate more on the kids' perception of them rather than being... Uh, these uh tough guys these rambos and whatnot what's your thoughts on that i'll be right back guys i i honestly don't 
what, what's wrong with being a tough guy, right? I mean, I think there's a fine line between being a tough guy and like toxic masculinity. You know, you you, you don't want to be someone that's like, I don't know, like a former president who's just full of himself and, you know, that kind of stuff and deliver the wrong message. But being a tough guy is not bad either. Um, I would have to see what did you see. Did you see Mike pull out the the, the toxic masculinity phrase on the set? I mean, yeah. Well done. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's wrong with the tough guy. It's just how it's portrayed being tough. Um, I think you can be a tough guy and also emotional guy. And I think you could be a tough guy and and not, you know, be someone that is afraid. I mean, look at, um, oh, gosh, um, the head coach uh, for the Eagles and the Chiefs and the Rams. I can't think of his name right now, but... um, he he cried like every you oh, Dick know Vermeil. Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil, thank you. Um Dick Vermeil. I think that's a great example of someone who's a tough guy but also is not worried about showing emotion. So yeah, I don't know. All right. Okay. Uh Mike, I'm gonna let you start on, on this next question oh, here. God, uh, I hate uh, this guy. oh okay uh so uh the nfl uh players association and uh watson deshaun has decided to challenge a full year suspension in court what's your thoughts i mean you know uh, for me you know i mean ray rice never got back on the field uh, right so you know i mean (laughs) Maybe I'm making too harsh a c- comparison, but you know, one as compared to let's see, 66 plus 24. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, y- y- your thoughts on this, Mike? I mean, I'm not against him challenging it. I mean, right? I mean, I think anybody would, right? And regardless, uh, guilt or innocence um as far as i mean not in the court of law but did he do it or didn't he do it i mean i if he didn't do it then i don't know who did but um i i I would too i mean if i'm in if i'm deshaun watson and i'm safe situation of course i want to play football i want to get paid i want to do all those things so i don't really mind him challenging it but i I think a year is like weeks off. I think this guy should be off the field for at least two years, if not more. I don't want to see this guy. I, I you know, this guy playing football, I, I don't want to see him. And uh, to me, as long as he can stay off the field, the more happier I'm going to be. I think the Browns should really, really get some kind of penalty for being just outright stupid and signing this guy. Um, and so how do you punish the Browns? Well, you make, Jacob Brisket, your quarterback, and you know you keep losing. So make right. make Jacob Brisket be your two year starter. Are you purposely mispronouncing point. Jacoby Brissett's name for yeah, Yes, I am. I don't know the backstory. <laughs> I need the backstory to why you are purposely <laughs> mispronouncing <laughs> Jacoby Brissett. <laughs> well, was it wasn't he a cold at one time? That's why. He was a cold. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, I, I thought I remember, but go Jacob ahead. Jacob Brisket, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, yeah i actually got i don't i think i think there is he was he was nicknamed that or something but my partner on my podcast always calls him jacob brisket so i just like <laughs> I, for years so now i've just like adopted it but um yeah um there's really no harsh feelings towards him he's just yeah subconscious talk in there uh so yeah <laughs> Uh, what, what, what's your thoughts here? Uh, I mean, you know, now, I mean, Mike brought up one point there that was kind of moot because all his money was guaranteed. So, right. you know, he so so it's not about the money. He's getting his money for the year. Uh, Texans just settled what twenty lawsuits, thirty lawsuits. Uh, you know, the Browns have, have settled their lawsuits, and uh, and we're more or less waiting. Uh, for the judge to pronounce her sentence. But to me, anything less than a year is a travesty. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts here, uh, Demetrius? So so I'm going to be uh, uh, different. <laughs> um, I think that if the NFL suspended every dirtbag, <clears throat> and we don't disagree that he's a dirtbag, he's got, no, I'm going to say he's got a problem. 
Look, the guy's got a problem. He's help. He needs help. He's got a problem. He he has behaved like a dirtbag. Antonio Clearly. Brown has a problem. They both have problems. So no, but I'm gonna say this. I don't I don't disagree with you guys. I think there's a suspension that's required. I think I would be fine with a year. I don't think that is the NFL trying to be noble or genuine about the NFL doesn't give a damn about these. No, masseuses. they don't care. They don't give a rat's ass about these masseuses. This nope. is a PR thing. They're basically in a room saying the next dude that's out here, I'm going to be cool. Even though we have to dark, the next dude is out here doing something like this. We need a precedent. We need a baseline where we, that's all the NFL cares about. Um, the Browns are who I have the problem with. Uh, uh, they hold, are the problem. Hold, hold on. When, where are we at here on your turntable? I guess that's what we established officially after the We are having All right, we're at the dark. Okay, so. Right, right. All, all, all right, so rest in peace, Earl Simmons. So here's the deal. Um, the Browns are who I hold. The, the message the Browns sent is, we don't give a damn about how you behave. We'll cut you a check. My problem is really because the Browns are, they didn't have to sign him. The NFL could have tried to say, hey, nobody signed this guy. But then if I'm a civil rights lawyer, I'm going to say, this guy's not been convicted of a crime and you are preventing him from earning a living at what he does. And I would have a good case. Mm -hmm. But as an individual business entity, any one of those teams could have said, we're not going to sign you. You know how I know that? Because there's a dude named Colin Kaepernick. They've done it. <laughs> They've done it. How in the hell does Colin Kaepernick not get a job and get blackballed and they rush and hand this dude 230 million guaranteed? That's the shameful thing to me. Yep. I'm always looking for a reason to bash Cleveland. They gave me a great one. That's who I dislike in this. I, I again, I struggle with oh, the league needs to do this. No, these individual business owners. Now, am I here to tell you guys Jimmy Haslam and the Haslam family are great people? Upstanding citizens who's never had their office raided by the FBI. Nope, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. I, I, I am. To me, the this is a deal where if the Lions had signed him, I would struggle. I, and you yeah. guys know how I feel about my team. Yep. I would have struggled. Me too. I, I don't even know if I could have gotten past it. I just yeah, don't. me too. I, 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 I was. Past it. I was telling my wife like. Thank God he didn't come to Indianapolis because I don't know what I would. I, I, I don't know if I, I could root for my team. Exactly. And, you know? and there was a guy, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, and you guys have to remind me because I always say the wrong guy. I always say it's Greg Hardy, and I don't think it's Greg Hardy. But the headline said he body slammed his girlfriend on a bed full of guns. That's Greg Hardy. That's yeah. Greg. It was yeah. Greg Hardy. Okay. Right. Yep. It was a superstar Greg Hardy, yes. Okay. And, and I was like, wait a minute. I just remember reading the headline, and it said he body slammed her on a bed full of guns. And I couldn't figure out if I want to understand bed full of guns more or, or <laughs> right? what that dude might still be in the league. I don't even know. But the league has shown us they don't feel like that's their response. It's not their job to produce good citizens, to hire good citizens. And there's some dirt bags that work for my company. I know it. That's fine. When the Cleveland Browns cut him a check for 230 guaranteed, that was the most disgusting display of virtually anything I've seen in that league. Even the body slam and the gun guy. Uh, uh, that's horrifying. So, so I'm my my anger is targeted much more at the Cleveland Brown organization. Now, at the end of the day, somebody else was going to do it. They were lined up. The Saints would have done it. Somebody else would have probably done it. That's the real problem. And that's just billionaires competing with other billionaires and not giving a damn about masseuses in the in the Cuyahoga County area at all. Look out, masseuses in Cuyahoga County, and 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 not the image that their players display to young people uh because that contract really bothered me really did me too yeah Oof. okay so there's a lot to unpack here uh and first of all shout out to bringing up the whole you know flying j um <laughs> I, I do love when we get to to throw one of these people under the bus so or in this case 18 wheeler uh so <laughs> yeah. When this all played out, and once again, there's another person I've known about since they were 16 years old, right? And we all saw the heartwarming stories and the 
you know, the, the how he got involved with Habitat for Humanity because at one point his family and and he were living in a Habitat for Manly house that was built by Warwick Dunn and all the cool stuff and all the, you know, the, the goodwill he built up. And to have the, all of that, not all of that, not just simply negated, but, I mean, we all can, I guess, decide what we believe. And as we pointed out, he's never been convicted or even charged with a crime. Right. But some of the things that some of these women have said are not things that would benefit them. You know what I mean? Like they've gone beyond, like, you know what I mean? Like this, some of the things I've heard them say are not things I think you would just say to get money. Right. Some of the things they've said are so specific and so, and you can see the discomfort. In- <laughs> okay. So yes. Right. <laughs> Fluids and other things that were just um, and their reactions to them. Uh, you could tell that there was something happened, right? And we can decide. Someone said, "Did he do it?" Well, what does one would decide what it is, right? Like, how do you define what it is? Uh, it's clear that he did something, right? And I know that prosecutors, particularly at a certain level, only want to bring forth cases they know they're going to win, right? If your winning percentage is ninety four percent or above you're not going anyplace as a, you know, as a state prosecutor, like you got to be killing it. You got to be winning pretty much all the time. So anytime there's any issues, like anything that you don't feel hundred percent strong, that you're definitely going to get a win. And then you don't, you wait until the case gets stronger. It's like, yeah, we'll see if something else comes in. Uh, so that's what some people don't realize when someone's been, when someone is not indicted, that's not the same as being exonerated. That's the opposite, not the opposite, but I mean, it's, 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 it's adjacent. It's not. It's not even on the same track. It's it's in a different place from even being exonerated. Being exonerated is when they find evidence that says you couldn't have done it. That's being exonerated. That's not what happened here. I heard people saying he's exonerated. Like no, no, I, I don't think you know what that what that team term means. Um, and someone said, you know, once again, we if he'd come to your team. Um, now what I will say about my team and my organization, not we have like every other team, we've had some dudes that weren't, you know, the best. But what I will say is they're not afraid to cut their losses. Um, and obviously the Ben Roethlisberger thing is still fresh in some people's minds, certainly mine. And I I wanted to see him, despite the fact he was the quarterback of my team, to be punished much more harshly than he was. I was disappointed with the fact that he was not punished, to me, sufficiently. And I understand that, you know, uh, once again, no charges were brought and, and even the cases were settled and, amicably you know the classic amicable resolution to you know um that's once again now i don't think people understand what that term means like that wasn't amicable it might have it might not have been a you know it might have been dragged through the case that you know the civil courts for years but it wasn't amicable i promise you there was still lots of bad feelings there but um, it was more financially yes well that part probably was amicable (laughs) i promise that's the only part that was amicable that, 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 that we do agree on. There were no hearty uh, handshakes across the aisle after they finished up the talk. No, 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 no. No, would you like to go out to dinner afterwards? None of that, no. No. So, no. Amicable, amicable means it's a check going clear. You assured <laughs> yeah. sure, sure me the check's going to clear. That's as amicable as that was. <laughs> um, Demetrius, Fournette shows up to camp overweight, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, basically looking like a, a lineman rather than a running back. Uh, how concerned should the Bucks be uh, about uh, you know uh, they just gave you, they just paid him all this money, and now you come in you know looking like uh, you know you just uh, left the, the all night buffet, uh, and uh, you know how do you think uh, Brady is going to overcome that? especially being without two of his key uh, offensive linemen. So it is not a coincidence, I, I obviously, that you said the word Tom, the words Tom Brady, and all of a sudden somebody's camera started working again. I'm just going to mention that. It's <laughs> 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 well, uh, a great time in there. <laughs> that shit was no coincidence. So here's my statement. Um, if you are a big running back inherently, 
Like you generally play at 230, 235, and you roll in at 260. Yeah, yeah that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. So there's no way to ignore that. And he, he wants to brush it off. If you have the ability to share 25 or 30 in six weeks of camp and get back into shape, okay, I'm interested in watching that. The reality is what it says, usually. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. It's a discipline thing, right? At the end of the day, it shows okay. it shows willpower and discipline. And when you sign the contract, you committed that you're going to keep your body in shape. You're going to come back and give us the best quality player you could give us. We all know that guy's not 260. You're not giving me that 260. So I'll just – transition segue that right into tom brady that doesn't help tom brady and the loss of those linemen don't help tom brady so i'm gonna disagree with the premise of your question tom brady's not going to overcome the loss of those linemen he's going to pay for it in painful ways that time um that is the reason that on this podcast i don't know a month ago i said the saints are going to win the division that is the reason that i still feel like the saints are going to win that division I think Tampa's going to take a full step back. And it's subtle things. It is no grind, even though I like somebody that they signed yesterday. I think. Anybody? Kyle Rudolph. Kyle Rudolph? Yeah. Uh, yep. Even though I like Kyle Rudolph, uh, it is Fournette coming in 260. It's the integration of those linemen. It is, oh, by the way, they had a change in head coach. We don't even talk mm-hmm. about the fact they had a change in head coach. Yep. And even though it's all the same, it's different. It's different. There's different terminology different meeting cases. It's different the way practice is run. So all those, uh, I heard a great term, oh, it's going to escape. Uh, it's going to escape. I'm going to come back to it later. It's something about a bunch, like a bunch of things built, aggregate of of minor gains or something. A bunch of little things build up. No big, massive thing happened. But there's a whole bunch of little things. All those little things together impact it. So, so I'm totally stretching the scope of this. I think the weight game is a good deal. He's not going to be as effective. I think the loss of the lineman is going to hurt Brady. It's so facto. It's going to hurt Tampa. It's so facto. It was awesome. That just rolled out. I need- <laughs> wow. I hope I used it right because it shit sounded didn't great. use it properly. Yes. Way to go. Excellent. Um, yeah. So I would prefer if he was 230. I'd prefer if they had Gronk and their offensive line intact. And I prefer if Tom Brady was 10 years younger. These things are all going to just add up. And I think it's going to be a tough season for Tampa. So, so I don't know if that's all, everything you asked. I tried to cover the whole thing in one fell swoop. <laughs> well, and yeah, I dropped ipso facto in there, too. So <laughs> They're lucky they play in that division with all those teams because, man, if they didn't, they'd be have a hard road. Yep. I, I don't think they could compete in your, your division, Demetrius, with Detroit and Green Bay. I don't think they would even come close. I, I think, I think you know, if and, – and I think we're going to talk about it, so I won't mess it up um, – my feeling about Carolina is different than it was the last time I spoke about Carolina. So I don't, I, just, I think that's an interesting division, but I think, yep. I think, I think Tampa's losses have mounted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chris, come on, man. Uh, are they just bashing Tom here or what? I mean, I, I think him. it's not a bash of Tom. I think it's just kind of the reality he's facing right now. Yep. Um, so of course, when you're losing two offensive linemen, you're going to want to rely on the run game and having your, one of the starting running backs come in 30 pounds overweight and in no shape or form looks like a running back is kind of a tough way uh, to start out your training camp here for Tom. So um, I'll never bet against Tom Brady. I've seen too much evidence to prove me wrong. If I was ever going to bet against Tom, which I would never. Um, So I'll still hope for the best for Tom, but I hope he makes it through the season healthy. And, you know, again, these guys are pro athletes and they have all kinds of resources at their fingertips. So, in all likelihood, who knows what Leonard Fournette can do during the offseason or not the offseason during training camp to try to shed this weight. You know, he's going to have nutritionists, you know, his weight regimen. He'll, he'll have tons of stuff at his hands to try to shed this weight before season starts. So, um, you know, a lot of that's now put on his shoulders to accomplish that feat. I'm sure Tom's going to be a guy in his corner pushing a little TB12 method for Leonard Fournette here for the future. Maybe shed some. Of <laughs> TB12 for Fournette. I love it. Uh, uh, guys, uh, I got to bring the fantasy thing in here because I've seen Fournette listed in most fantasy football top 40s, top 50 at least. And how much impact is this going to have? You know, I asked you guys about, you know, 
quarterbacks the other week. Uh, what, what kind of impact is this going to have on fantasy owners uh, trying to pick up uh, Fournette or those that may have him in a dynasty uh, in a keeper league? Bill. Yes. You're asking about fantasy impact? Huh. Okay. That's I mean, 30 pounds is a lot. And it, yeah. it definitely changes the way I feel about Leonard Fournette in my fantasy league. Right. <laughs> in, 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 if you're in PPR and you're looking at him as a receiver, um, you don't see too many 260 pound running backs catching the ball very often. Right. So that's one thing. Um, I think he will drop some of that weight. Now, can he lose all of it in this amount of time? It's not impossible. It's unlikely. Uh, but it's, uh, it, yeah, it's unlikely. Not impossible, but unlikely. Um, now, for me, as a dynasty guy who's got Keyshawn Vaughn, um, selfishly, I'm hoping that he struggles all season to get in shape. <laughs> and they're forced to play some of their young guys. But, I mean, I think that he will get in good enough shape that he you know plays a decent number of snaps. Now, the thing about – oh, what was the – there was a Leonard Fournette food tweet from, like, a sophomore year at LSU. I can't remember what it was. He had a funny food um it had to do with like chinese food i can't remember exactly what it was but it was very funny uh but yeah i mean he was those people sort of you know you're sort of country you know sort of a guy makes sort of funny remarks sometimes about being exposed to the outside world or whatever but he's now you know a an established nfl pro he's still one of the faster backs big backs in the league he still can run now, probably maybe not quite as fast as before. Um, if he continues to struggle with weight, this will definitely have an impact for two weeks. One is you can't play as many snaps, right? When you're out of shape, you gas out easier. And like I said, in PPR leagues particularly, I, I can't imagine they'll throw the ball to him nearly as much if indeed he's struggling with his weight because you, you know, the reason you're throwing the ball to someone, especially a running back someone, is hoping they'll get you yards after the catch. If you're two, two, you know, 260 plus, that greatly cuts down on the chance of you getting good yards after the catch because you, once again, you're less quick, you're less, less nimble, I and mean, all the things you want from running backs, you're less of when you're out of shape. So yeah, that's what I think will happen. Chris, you're a fancy guy. What's up? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with every, what everyone else has said, and then just um, to hit on what Bill was talking about, so. Uh, Zeke tweeted, uh, birthday around the corner, what y'all get me? And Leonard Fournette responded, a treadmill fat ass. Yeah, <laughs> that's the tweet I've been getting re roasting now, Leonard Fournette. So, yeah, fantasy wise, I've never been a, a big Leonard Fournette guy for my in fantasy. I've never really liked him. So, I don't like him even more now. And then another little tidbit I pulled up is we talked about them signing, signing Kyle Rudolph. He's weighing in at 265. Ooh. So, just five pounds more, but he's also 6'6. Six, six. Right. <laughs> Rudolph's always and a big end. kid. Yeah. Two yeah. yeah. coming out of Notre Dame. He's always a big, big kid. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, maybe they should just call the Yankees. I mean, you know, you, you got some big guys on the Yankees. Why not just call the Yankees and say, hey, I got this, this guy, this guy, and this guy. You know, uh, can I get the uh, 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 Geo Stanton and, 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 and Aaron Judge and, you know. And have them run play running back? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. Linebacker. You know, uh, the right tackle, whatever the wherever the hell you want to plug him in. I mean, you know, what, what, might, what's, might the, judge well. is a good, the judge is a good two seventy uh, from what I, I looked at him the other night. I mean, oh yeah, he's he's above two seventy. Yeah. <laughs> Albert Pujols, I think he's old, but he's a big dude too. See, I don't. The Mariners have a big dude too. I forget what his name is. Um, yeah, but no, no, nobody's got that Yankees lineup though. I mean, no, 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 no. Yeah, but, that's but, true. But, 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 what do you think? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Mister Dynasty here. Uh, well, I think with Leonard Fournette, he's just turned twenty-seven. Um, so you're you're definitely looking more on the downward end of, of his career for dynasty purposes. He still holds some value, good early, you know, fourth, fifth round kind of value, but it's yeah, it's on the downward trend. And this isn't something that uh Fournette is 
hasn't been done before. I mean, he struggled with weight in college and, um, you know, now he's struggling obviously now with the pros. And then when you're injured, you know, almost every single season and you're, you're, you know, a big dude. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's not going to help either. So I don't, I don't know what health wise he's going to have to lose. How many pounds, like you guys were saying, like 30 pounds in like a month and a half. That's, that's yeah. not healthy. Um, exactly. um, so that, that's a, a lot of play to it as well. Um, Rashad White, that's probably the dynasty you're going to want to get, especially if you're a Leonard Fournette manager. You know, go look for Rashad White, his backup. They're they're pretty similar kind of players. So, if I'm dynasty and I have Leonard Fournette, I'm definitely dra- drafting a Rashad White. Um, but yeah, he still holds some value. We'll, we'll see. He is, I think Bill was talking about, he, he does catch a, a lot of passes, he's pretty good at that. So, he does have, have a floor for fantasy purposes because he does catch so many passes. And then they're missing Chris Godwin and two. So they'll definitely look his direction. Uh, Mike, uh, pro football focus uh, ranks Jonathan Taylor uh, as 21st among the top 50. Uh, Derek Henry is ranked 16th, I believe. Uh, oh. Will Taylor become the fourth running back since 1999? to lead the league in rushing for consecutive years? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, only four since 1999 because the odds are definitely get you, but the table's set for them. Uh, so the Colts are going to run, 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 and Jonathan Taylor's that kind of guy. Uh, just an all, all-around great, great athlete, whether it's running around the end, through the gaps, home run speed, running over players, and he's young. And they have a very good offensive line. Uh, so the table is set for him. It says whether it's going to be a consecutive or uh, continuous um, process for him to continuously be Jonathan Taylor. And that's going to be hard for him, I think. Naheem Hines is going to have a bigger role than than he did last year. So we'll see. Um, I, I But, yeah, I, if he finishes it, it's not going to be surprising by any means. Uh, Bill, let's talk about the deal that the cards gave uh, Kyle and Murray today. Five-year extension, $230.5 million. Uh, that includes $160 uh, million guaranteed. Uh, a lot of people thought that, uh, you know, well, you know, uh, it's a lot of money to give Kyle and Murray. But, uh, Bill, uh, was this the lesser of two evils? Give it to him now or wait until next year? Well, I mean, I'm not sure it's even how the decision they were considering or if that's the decision they made. I do know that they truly do believe in him. And, I mean, the GMs cannot be fair arbiters in these things because this is a player they, fe- you know, fell in love with Leeds football-wise, you know, a few years ago while, while they were watching them. And some of the members of their staff uh, were – some of them were even coaching in the high school ranks when he was a legend at Allen in Texas. So there was a – real affection for him in the building. Uh, I know some fans are amb- ambivalent about him, but he is, there's none of that within the building. He's much below. Uh, we knew who he was, I mean, quarterbacks, right? The top tier quarterbacks, we knew all of them were going to get paid. We knew that. We knew that coming in. Uh, the only question is, will he be number one? Will he be number two? Like, we knew he was going to be in the top three most, you know, highest sales. Like, we knew that, that he's going to be, before he, you know, before any of this started, we knew people who pay attention to they're going to create or encourage whatever term you want to use uh, a, a person to become, you know, their, I don't know, the, what they developed. Right. And in this situation, you have this uh, quarterback market that is heated up. I think is the proper term we might use in a couple of months. We won't look at this as being a bad deal because one or two more quarterbacks have gotten superior deal. Uh, Chris is one of those quarterbacks that, that uh, Bill referring to going to be Lamar Jackson. I mean, it looks like it. I mean, <clears throat> if Kyler's going to get this money, then I mean, Lamar definitely can demand this kind of money. Um, I've never been huge on Kyler Murray. I think he still needs to prove it to me. Um, him and Cliff Kingsbury, they've been great in September and October. And then once the pressure gets on and they've had some success, just everything falls apart. 
And again, <clears throat> we've seen the success of shorter quarterbacks here, Drew Brees is here, Russell Wilson's. But again, those are so sporadic in the league that I just don't see the long-term success of a guy that is short like Kyler and just smaller, takes the hits, he's mobile, out of the pocket. Um, I just don't see it. So I'm surprised the Cardinals, you know, put the money into him. I mean, again, they were in a spot where they needed to figure out if they were going to pay him or not, and they chose to pay him. Um, I probably would have, you know, maybe gone in a different direction, but that's their choice. And I'm surprised the money he gets, like, you know, you, you put it out, he's, you know, just right there, right below Pat Mahomes. And if I was going to have a choice between Pat Mahomes and Kyler Murray, I think it's a 10 out of 10, I'm taking Pat Mahomes. So um, I was a bit surprised to see the number, but again, you know, Bill talked about how much faith the organization has in Kyler and there he needs to now show that he, he talked too much on Twitter about wanting to be a top guy and you need to get paid. And now it's time to show it, Kyler. What's your thoughts there, Demetrius? Uh, he still doesn't have a, uh, you know, I mean, his playoff record uh, isn't that good as, as uh, you know, uh, Chris pointed out, uh, card started out seven and zero and, then they lost one wheel, then they lost a couple of wheels. But uh, what's your thoughts? And, and what do you think the impact is going to be on Lamar Jackson? In the spirit of answering the second part first, which people tend to do in these questions, uh, <laughs> I think Chris just nailed it. Lamar's about to get his bag, right? We, we, we don't generally make this mistake. I almost never make it. When the guy signs a deal and they report it, oh, it makes him the highest paid. It makes him the state. That has nothing to do with how good they are relative to other guys. It just means he was the last dude. He's the most recent contract. That's almost always what it means. Now, I used to be in the camp dead with Chris, like on both points. I've adjusted a little because I'm going to ask you guys, how many quarterbacks do you think in their first three years have 70 passing touchdowns, 20 rushing touchdowns, 400 rushing yards, and 17 games with a completion percentage over 70? 17 games with a completion percentage over 70. Easy answer, just one. And it's Kyler Murray. I think Kingsbury's the problem, right? I think Kingsbury's the problem. I think Kyler Murray's very talented. I know what it was. I'm 6'4". I didn't like him because he was short. Because I generally don't get down with short people. As a rule, I don't trust him. I don't trust left-handed people, and I don't trust really short people. You got to prove yourself to me. I don't know how tall you are, Chris. You all right with me already, though? I'm over, I'm over six foot, but I, okay, cool. I, I don't I trust short you. people, man. I don't, you, I don't, you're I, reminding I, me of the Randy Newman song, "Short People." Exactly. I don't know if you've heard yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I got no purpose for him. I don't trust cats. I'm a dog dude. I don't like left-handed people except my sister, and I don't trust short people that much. So, so I didn't like him because he was short. But then he just made the point of he's got to prove it. And I read those stats and I thought, damn. Well, you, you really it. hated Doug Flutie, didn't you? Oh, I yeah. I did not like Doug Flutie at all. I did not. I did not like Doug Flutie. I thought that dude cashed a bunch of checks he didn't deserve. But whatever. We're not going to Doug Flutie because he might be a nice guy. I don't know. <laughs> but but um, uh, I think that I thought to myself, man, have I been fair to Kyler Murray? I looked at his numbers through his first few years and thought, He's he's productive. I can't say he's not productive, and I've never been a Kingsbury guy, and I, I I I don't know. But my biggest problem with him is the whole millennial scrub your page to send the message. Back in the old days, we just go in the room, sit down, and talk, and work this out, right? So I don't like the whole scrubbing your social media thing, but that's the way you do it now. You scrub the social media, you get a bag full of money, you get a bag with one hundred sixty million dollars in it. So maybe I'm gonna scrub my social media to hell with it. See if the Lions will cut me a check. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See if the Lions will cut me a check. My scrum, my social. Um, but no, I, I, I'm cool with it. My thoughts are more on Kingsbury. Um, uh, and it, it is a timing thing. Right now, he's right behind Rodgers. But Bill made the point a while ago. Um, Lamar's going to sign his deal. Somebody else will sign a deal. I remember when Matthew Stafford was the highest paid quarterback. It was like two and a half years ago. Yeah. The Lions <laughs> re-upped him, and he was the highest paid quarterback in NFL history. Right? Yeah. Now there's been like... 15 deals. It's, yeah, it's crazy. He's like 16th like, or something. It's like Herbert may be next, maybe him. Yeah, Herbert. That's yeah, it. Yeah, Herbert and yeah. Lamar, and then this deal will be appropriately where it's <laughs> So, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Mr. Dynasty, uh, Mike, uh, Colin Coward says that the Vikings will go to the playoffs with a 13-4 and record. 
What's your thoughts? Are the Vikings that good? Jefferson says uh, uh, at the end of the season, he's going to be the top wide receiver, not uh, uh, Devontae. Um, yeah, real, real quick. I got <laughs> my <Mike> dog holding. <laughs> Something's going on. I think one of those untrustworthy ass cats is doing something. <laughs> I bet it's one of them untrustworthy damn cats. Oh, oh, it ain't the dog. Oh, the dog might have to go. I don't know. I figure it's probably one of the cats, though. I'm not blaming the dog. <laughs> See, the, and it's a short cat, too, right? <laughs> you know, it was a cat causing drama. The dog was fine. No, no, that, that was my German Shepherd who decided that his little squeaky toy was going to be a great entertainment while we were talking oh, cool. here. <laughs> Every no podcast, no podcast is complete without a squeaky toy. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, yeah, that's a hard record to match, uh, especially with that trashy ass defense. Um, so thirteen to three, no. Um, will will they make the playoffs? They got a shot. Uh, so I don't know what what he was like. I don't know if he fell down the stairs before he got on the radio or what. It's called but, crack cocaine. That's what it's or, <laughs> I was going to be a little bit like, yeah. <laughs> they, got well be, yeah. <laughs> they got a new coach. They lost some players on defense. They got to play the Lions twice. Now, hell no, they ain't winning 13. Yeah, they're not winning 13. They're not 13 going and 13 four. And Get out of here with that. I, I could see no, the no, Lions no, sweeping no, them. No, no, don't make me I have to call be. Mr. Scott. Call Mr. Scott because we should have swept them last year. <laughs> <laughs> we, beat them, we beat them in Detroit, and they beat us on a record-setting <laughs> field goal in Minnesota. Ah, Mr. Scott don't want none of this smoke. He <laughs> wants zero in this smoke. He knows that. <laughs> uh, uh, and, 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 and what's your thoughts about Jefferson? Uh, you know, is is he going – I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm – Thinking of uh, the comparison here between Kurt Cousins and Derek Carr, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I don't know if there's any real advantage in offensive lines, but I mean, you you, you could probably answer that too. Yeah, I, I think I think there are some good similarities between Carr and, and Cousins. Um, I think Carr has probably a stronger arm. Well, not probably he does. Uh, but Kirk Cousins is probably more accurate in the short to intermediate game. Not saying that Carr is inaccurate because he is, uh, but yeah, I think that would be the, the probably disparity. But both are very similar, especially when we're talking fantasy. Um, one one will go like twelve QB twelve, the other one will go QB thirteen or wherever. But they're they're really tight tight um as far as how you you'll draft them all right everybody joining us today on the podcast uh we have nick agar johnson nick is, is the a preview of his podcast is that, what <laughs> that, is that coming through yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh sorry I just, oh, yeah. oh, that's good stuff that. who's joining us again today yeah i'm jealous <laughs> <Who's joining laughs> I'm joining i've been trying my to get guests on my podcast for a month man. <laughs> no, it's one of the no ceilings nba guys Okay. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um. Um. But yeah, I, I I think that both are very similar kind of players with Carr having the advantage in arm strength. The Raiders' offensive line, Vikings' offensive line aren't all that great either. Um. Maybe the head. Maybe the knob go to the Raiders, but not by much. I don't think that's the only thing we have to consider, though. I'd like to just say Justin Jefferson is right, except he's got a new coach. He's got a new OC. Yes, they do. We don't, we don't, we don't have a baseline of data to say what Justin Jefferson is going to be. It's, I think his name is McConnell. I feel like Mike McConnell, Mike McDonald, something like that, right? Yeah, correct. The new coach. I don't know if we have data to tell us what Justin Jefferson is going to be in that offense. I think um, we know what Devontae Adams is. We know what Derek Carr is, and they're they, they got a new coach. So never mind. Yep. You. They both got new coaches. I don't know the answer to this question. I like Justin Jefferson a lot. <laughs> But Devontae, I think both are going to throw more. Both I just talk, talk myself out of my point. That's how good I am. You're like, I talk myself out of my own point. Too. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wait. They both got coaches. We don't know. Great question, Mr. King, because we don't know the answer. Yeah. Chris <laughs> might know the answer. Until we find out. But he's we programming won. his next podcast. So I don't really care. <laughs> uh, see, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Chris, uh, the 49ers have given Jimmy G the okay to see trade partners. Uh, what do you think about uh, Jimmy G ending up as a giant? Uh, I think it's interesting. I think they're pretty sure they're going to let Daniel Jones 
uh, prove it this year. I think they're they're putting a lot behind him to see if he's the guy. Um, I think Jimmy G's landing spots are probably similar to where we thought Baker Mayfield was going to end up. So you still got Seattle in the mix. Um, I I was out. My wife texted me when you guys were talking uh, Deshaun Watson, but I think the Browns are definitely in the mix. Um, they did just get Josh Rosen. Yeah, Rose. they just hired Rosen for on a, on, on a one year deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think those are some of the teams in the mix. I think the Giants are interesting though. I mean, if they if things don't work out with Daniel Jones, I think Jimmy Garoppolo will definitely be a hot name next off season for teams that are going to be looking for a quarterback. Because wherever he does end up this year, it'll probably just be um, a one year kind of deal. I don't think it'll be anything long term. So um, we'll kind of see. I don't think it's going to be the Giants though. I think it's going to you know most likely be maybe Seattle. Has Has Brian Dable come out and made any kind of public statement about his thoughts on Daniel Jones? Or his quarterback situation? I don't think I've seen anything. And that's that's generally what I've been looking for is, ha- has there been a statement one way or another leaning like, I think ba- it's Baker's well, job in Carolina to lose. But uh, the Giants, I don't know that I've read anything or seen anything publicly mm-hmm. about well, where uh, Brian Dable stands with. I think it's mostly yeah, the media yeah. saying, like, they're they're trying to get behind Daniel Jones this year. But, yeah, I haven't seen anything yeah. official either. Yeah, they, they pretty much are committed to Daniel Jones yeah. this year. Yeah. This is his prove-it deal, prove-it mm-hmm. year. But but if you look at their 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 schedule, and they start out two and five or one and six, are they really going to stick with Daniel Jones? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Saquon Barkley is is, is is you know I mean you know, he's a question mark in that offense. Yeah. You know, Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Uh, you know, uh, I think if they start out, uh, you know, like I said, you know. Uh, one and six or, or two and five, uh, the first change will be Daniel Jones, I think. Uh, what do you I, guys I, think? Yeah, I, I generally like to agree with you, except there's a kid named C.J. Stroud in the draft next year. Yeah. There's a kid named Bryce yeah. Young in the draft next year. Yeah, I Ballard, think you played, yeah, you played Daniel Jones to that number one pick. Yeah. You, <laughs> you quietly act like you wish he was better. But <laughs> you let him lose you games. And At you least you didn't throw three pick. interceptions this game. He only threw two. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. hey, we thought that's improvement. That's called exactly. improvement. So, yep. so yeah, I think you ride it out. I think Dable's in the first year, so he has that one thing we all love: security. They have fire him after one year, right? So, and if they secure one of those top picks and get one of those quarterbacks, they'll live with whatever Daniel Jones does this year. I don't think and, they're going to make a big stink about any of it. And what they have back there isn't. I mean, they have Tyrod Taylor and um, who else is it? Um, Davis Webb. Yeah, so cash and checks. What? Ty yeah, Rod. Ty all right, Ty Taylor. Gets direct uh-huh. deposit. Tyrod gets direct deposits every two weeks, man. He I wonder care. if he got did he end up getting medical money too for the uh collapse? Yeah. He should holy hell, money. exactly. Dude, it's suited <laughs> for like forever. Geez, wow. the organization <laughs> and everything else. What's the uh, who's the Texans quarterback? Did you say? Oh, you David. said David. Uh, white. Uh, or Mills? Wait, Web. I might be confusing. Is, is it Webb? Oh, Mills is Web, Web in New York. Giants uh, Mills. 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 I thought it was Mills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mills yeah. was with the Texans. I, knew, I thought I was mixing them up. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know where he lands. To get back to your question, I took us off track. I don't know where G lands. I, I Seattle still needs a quarterback, right? Yeah. Do you yeah. not yeah. play them in the division? Is that a thing still or no? I mean, they're, they're just as bad. Drew Locke and um, Geno Smith. But who's going to trade for him? He's got a $25 million tag on him. Well, With a bum shoulder. Wait, right. Wait for them to release him, which they inevitably have to do. Yeah. And you can get him for peanuts. Unless you swing some deal where they pay him the way Cleveland's paying Baker. I don't, I'm don't. i not trading. I'm not giving up assets to get Jimmy G with a bad shoulder and a $25 million uh, price tag. I'll pass on that. I'll play Davis anybody. I'll play Davis Jones. I'll play David Kendrick. I don't care, man. <laughs> he said the Bears might take a run at him too to back up Justin Fields, but again, I don't oh, think it's, it's a lot of money for a backup quarterback. Twenty five million. That's that's but but that sounds like a bear like thing to do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Let's pay a backup twenty five mil. Yeah. Well, not you know, everybody's kind of mentioned around Baker here. So uh uh AFC Scout says that uh, starting Baker uh uh will lead the Panthers to a possible seventh seed in the playoffs. Bill, is this realistic? Well, you're not getting Bill right now. You know that. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and take it. Bill's Bill's in the middle of a solid nap, bro. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right. I, there I'll he is. There. I'll take it. He can pick go, up go, my go. Go, I, go, I'm going to take it because I'm the minority. Uh, I happen to be, like Baker. 
I happen, I happen to believe Baker played most of last year with a bum non-throwing shoulder. I think Baker is much closer to the guy he was two years ago than he is the guy he was last year. I think that's why he's salty. That's why he feels like he toughed it out and played tough guy back to the Teddy Bridgewater point and didn't get rewarded. Um, I, I think he's short-sighted. He just didn't see that his team had a chance to grab a dirt bag who was more talented than him. And that's what they chose to do. But I think that team will burn in hell metaphorically because that's what they deserve. So I think Baker, a healthy Baker, assuming he gets a healthy Christian McCaffrey, mm-hmm. can be a really effective quarterback in Carolina. I, I don't think I don't have a, a talent question with Baker. I've always questioned his maturity and uh uh his health. That's it. If his shoulder's right, um, he'll be fine. Carolina's a good spot. Nobody expects much. Cleveland picked up most of the tabs, so money isn't an issue. He wasn't their number one pick. I think he's in a perfect situation. So I think Baker's going to surprise a lot of people and play well. Well, surprisingly, uh, you know, we kind of called that here on the sports grid months ago that Cleveland would pick up most of that and yep. Baker would be a $5 million quarterback, yep, uh, yep. which he happened to be. Uh, Chris, hey, your thoughts? Uh Baker leading uh, the Panthers to the playoff spot. I mean, you know, we got Moses in a burning bush, Abraham somewhere around here in the corner. I mean, what, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, I I don't know. We, we went somewhere else. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, Bible, I could see uh, it. Bible references. <laughs> no, I got you. <laughs> yeah. the wrong show, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, hey, uh, I mean, you know, hey, B- Baker going to the playoffs. I mean, you know. My yeah, I mean, a biblical man. level accomplishment. Wow, wow. Uh, miracles happen. Man. Miracles wow. happen. Uh, you know, is he gonna bring down seven tablets when he comes to practice? I mean, wow. you know, I, yeah, go, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I'm gonna be with Demetrius on this. I'm, I'm excited to see what Baker can do because I think he's always thrived when he has you know a solid run game. And if Christian McCaffrey can stay healthy, then he's gonna give him, I think, more. I mean, Nick Chubb, of course, was just a pound it kind of running back. But I think Christian McCaffrey will give him a little bit more versatility being that three down back. Hopefully he can stay healthy. And, you know, I think we'll kind of see what they can do with their options on the outside. But I think Baker's always kind of been able to, you know, succeed with shit around him. So he's, <laughs> I think he can do the same in Carolina. You know, a wild card isn't out of the thought for Carolina at this point. I mean, I think we were talking a lot differently about them a month ago before Baker signed with them. But you know now it's a little bit different. Chris, what's your thoughts on Baker here? Chris, Chris gets his thoughts. I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, no, Mike. I'm sorry. The hell, I don't like I'm that. Like, I'm, I, I, I don't get to share. <laughs> He's confusing um, with the, it's the beards. It's the beards. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I should just confuse Actually, it even more by I, doing the backwards yeah, hat. Now, now, I, now, good luck, James. I, now, tell I, us I, apart. <laughs> no, no. Actually, Mike, uh, you look more like the guy on Deadliest Catch. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not. <laughs> I, I need to get my fishing pole now, and everything will be real. Yeah. Right there you on. go. Lots of lo, lots of pots. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. King, nah. King now Grant. you're getting me hungry. I haven't I'm, had dinner I'm, yet. I, I want to hear your thoughts on Baker. Don't start talking about food yet, because I'll drop <laughs> off. <laughs> I want to get some baked lobster. Big <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I think they have a great shot just because that division is sucky. I mean, um, Tampa Bay will give them their. their toughest competition uh i mean there's not going to be a huge difference outside of probably more consistency with uh baker than sam darnold but these two quarterbacks aren't like wonderful um so we'll, we'll see but yeah I, I think they have a good shot at landing that seven spot i wouldn't be surprising can we do the rest of the podcast talking about Bill? Bill? <laughs> Are you making it so difficult? I can't it's so great because you want I see what you're doing, man. And I respect the way you moderate these podcasts. You really want him to like be back. You just want to check him. And it's like hey, we're nope. gonna get him back. What's going on? One of these times we're gonna come in. He's gonna, gonna be talking to Red Bull, like, what are we talking about? <laughs> It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> we might as well keep rolling. I'm sorry I keep laughing though. I don't even have my full voice. The second that, that when he popped back in, I just I couldn't. <laughs> I can't even help it. He's ready. <laughs> Mike, is this a boom or bust year for Zeke? Stay in Dallas. 
Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's going to matter, really. I think he's – this is his last year, um, and then they'll either give the ball completely to Tony Pollard or drop someone. All right, like I that. think we got Bill back. Bill, you here? Yes. All, All right. right. <laughs> We're on Zeke Elliott, boom or bust. Go, Mike. <laughs> um, so – Tony Pollard will take over the backfield next season and we'll see if he's going to share it or if it's going to be completely his, but it, it, yeah, Ezekiel Elliott's gone regardless. They, they can get out of that contract after this year too, right? That's, yep. yeah. me, that's what it really is. It's about when can they eat yeah, get they out of that thing and that contract not cripple their cap. Right. It's, right. About. it's no longer about productivity. Mike's right. It's, yeah. it, it was bust last year. They just couldn't eat that dead cap number. Yeah, it, it was. It, if they would released him um, for the start of this year, it would it would have been a lot more heavier than it would be yeah. for next year. I think next year's are out. Yeah, pull up the contract, see when they can release him and not get killed. That's okay. when. That's when Zeke's no longer a cowboy. What do you think, Bill? Boomer bust for Zeke. Well, I mean, I think he'll be a little more productive when he gets touches because he's gonna get fewer touches, right? And it's easier in a smaller sample size to be more efficient. But as was said earlier, the transition has already begun. They've already begun working Pollard into more and more parts of the offense. You know, he's, when he first got there, he was sort of a third down guy. And, you know, and whenever and then whenever Zeke was out, he was the man and things like that. Well, he's going to be closer to a full on timeshare this year. And as has already been discussed, uh, it goes from, you know, 20 something million dollars worth of dead cap uh, stop being part of the, the problem uh, to 30 release. million. Yeah. God, Jesus. That's if, they cut him, if they cut him um, the start before, if he was not a cowboy today, they would have had to eat 30 million dollars. That's atrocious uh, contract. Oh, and sorry. then next year with the dead cap, they do have an out potential out. Um, it's going to cost them um, about 12 million. So going from 30 to 12. You can eat 12, can't eat 30. Yep. Uh, what, what you, let me move on from him. What, what's your thoughts on, on this, uh, Chris? Uh, and, and, you know, maybe you can also talk uh, to us about the fantasy value. Usually, uh, Tony gets the yards, Zeke gets the touchdowns. Are we going to see an equal effect this year? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Chris is going to get her to set out one sec. Hold on. No worries. Of course, just perfect timing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone's been saying. There we go. See where this is aiming. Let's see. There we go. Let's make this professional. All right. Is it back? Let's see. I don't know. All right. We can hear you. We can't see you, but go ahead. I'll leave this for now until I fix it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely um, a big year for Zeke. Like we said, it's his last year of his deal. So he's definitely got to prove it to, you know, see who's going to give him that next contract. Um, but like everyone's highlighted, I think it's Tony Pollard's job to, you know, gain at this point and prove why he's going to be the guy moving forward in Dallas. Um, Fantasy-wise, I'm definitely going to be looking to snag Tony Pollard early this year compared to other years when he was more of a handcuff for Zeke where – like I said, this year he's going to get more of a dual share of the running back load. Um, Mike, uh, uh, Edward Delaire says uh, that this is going to be his first, well, this is going to be his first season as the primary running back. Uh, what do you think uh, his he's going to be here uh, as far as uh, how many rushing yards? uh, uh is he going to get uh, uh, over 150 rushing yards? Uh, what about total t uh, TDs? Uh, that's rushing and passing, uh, a, com a combination of 10 or more or 10 or less. Yeah, I don't even know if he's the primary running back. Ronald Jones might have something to say about that. Jarek McKinnon might have something to say about that. Um, but to answer your question, rushing yards over under, I would say under I, I, 600. Um, no way he's going to score 10 touchdowns. That That's his, he, I think he's, he's scored four so far in his career, four or five. Um, he, he's never been a touchdown producer. Uh, he never will be a touchdown producer. So yeah, there's no way he scores 10, 
comes close to scoring 10 touchdowns. Bill, what do you think uh, Alaire's fantasy value is going to be? Uh, or Actually, his rushing uh, value uh, under 850 yards? Oh, Yeah, I mean, if somebody – if you can take the under and somebody gives you even odds, you might as well have just hit them over the head and taken their wallet. So, yes, uh, under is a strong play, I think it would be fair to say. And someone mentioned Ronald Jones. I mean – I, I, once again, you know, have heavily invested in Ronald Jones. I think he ends up, if not at the beginning of the season, before the move over, becoming their primary running back. <laughs> oh, hey, hey. We give, we give many Chris. We give per, percentage Chris. We'll take, we'll take five-eighths of Chris. We got zero hearing of Chris, but we get a, a now, block He's, of he's a little person yeah, now I'm for you, Demetrius. Turn my sound back up so you there don't hear go. There His go. voice uh, is still solid, though. His voice is still solid. Thanks. Chris, you just heard what, what Demetrius said about short people. Now, yeah. you know? <laughs> I made my feelings clear. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question, by the way. Did Clyde say this or did somebody else say this? Because I'm kind of with Bill. I mean, except for the knocking somebody over the head shit. That's just a little, a little strong, Bill. But but did Clyde say this or did somebody else say this? Clyde said this. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Clyde, 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 Clyde doesn't Clyde. understand what team he plays for. <laughs> yeah, Clyde he's confused. The system <laughs> of his coach. Is what we well, but, but but Clyde also realizes that you know Tyreek Hill is gone. You know how many touchdown passes did Juju catch? Clyde yeah, doesn't I, run a four two eight, and he can't play no, in the slot. What is uh, that? I, all I'm saying is it, my understanding of Andy Reid and that system is not going to produce that from anybody except it probably hasn't since shady in his prime back in philly and i don't even know if shady put up 10 and 900 yeah he might have he might have that's not andy reed's system that i know not the one in kansas city i mean i mean good luck good luck clyde but i'm not investing a draft pick in your ass i know that he's had 11 <laughs> touchdowns in two years clyde over to Lair. 11 total he's, he's gonna put up 10 this year and yeah he's gonna put up 10 uh, yeah that makes 10, it ever dude 10 or under under, but I'm he, not going to commit a thought he, like Bill recommended. So he, 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 he could produce yeah. eight this year. You yeah, know, Jeff uh, you know. could steal some too. Yeah. 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 All right, guys. Uh, Demetrius, uh, I don't have Mr. Scott, so I'm going to throw this your way because uh, it's your division. Good. And you say that you're going to beat these guys twice this year, not once, but twice. So, we have a situation here where it's possible that Dylan and Jones, the Green Bay backfield, could, for the first time since, what is it, uh, what year is that that I put down? Oh, uh, no. Uh, oh, no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they could be the first, uh, well, the next uh, tandem for each to rush for 1,000 yards. What do you think about uh, – do you think that it, it's possible? Will the Packers, Aaron, and, and Dylan be the first uh, to do it in over a decade? Surprisingly, I don't think this is that 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 crazy a take, right? I think that with Devontae moving on, uh, his, his, his throw – his, that guy who I won't say his name, he will throw the ball maybe a little less. Uh, they might run more. They're both very talented. The only question is health, right? They both got to play a lot. Think about, though, 1,000 yards is like 70 yards a game. This ain't out of the question that they could have these guys average 70 yards a game. They, they run it that well. Their, their old line's that good. Um, systemically, they've thrown the ball too much for both of them to do it. So my number one concern would be health. They would both have to stay healthy for a large period of the season. If you're going to tri- like a legitimate split, then they both got to stay healthy all year. If one guy gets hurt, I don't know. They both are likely going to miss time because of injuries because it's the NFL and their running backs, and that's just how that works. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I never said we were going to beat the Packers twice. I said we are going to beat the Vikings twice. I need oh, that okay. clear, cleared okay. up on the record. Uh, I'm not quite that bold just yet. <laughs> I'm getting there, but I ain't quite there. Um, okay. It could happen. If, if everything goes well, this wouldn't shock me. A lot of things have to go well. A lot of things have to go well to do that. Just the balance. 
I think Aaron Jones is a really, really good running back. I don't know why. And people fell in love with Dylan, and they acted like Aaron Jones fell off. Aaron Jones never fell off. I don't know what the problem that people have with Aaron Jones is, but a lot of things have to go really well for this particular stat to happen. But but I don't think it's impossible. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I think it's definitely uh, in all the realms of possibility. Like Dimitri said, it's 70 yards a game, and this team loves to run the ball, especially once it's going to get to winter time. Uh, we talked about the lack of threats I think they have in the receiving game um, right now actually, after losing Devontae Adams. So I think Aaron Rodgers is going to be relying heavily on his running game this year. Uh, so I could definitely see both these guys being 1,000-yard runners for sure. Yeah, Mike, uh, isn't the Packers receiving court right somewhere in the low 20s? It's got to be because there's nobody there. I mean, <laughs> Alan Lazard is probably their best player. Uh, we'll see what Christian Watson is, but he's a rookie. Uh, you have um, cast-offs. Um, Sammy. You know, Sammy, Sammy Watkins, as, as yeah. Demetrius mentioned. And um, when Mari Rogers, we'll see. He'll be in a second season. He might be something. But, yeah, it's just a, a lot of non-proven – um, proven players, uh, inconsistency or bad players in, from, you know, cast off team. So it's not, it's not a great situation for them as well. And I agree. I, I think that they're going to run the ball a lot more. They're going to have to. And this is, you know, it's, as Demetri said, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it can be doable and we'll see. I, I think both are, are very primed to and capable running backs to do so. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Bill, you probably know these guys' stats since Pop Warner, but what's your thought? I mean, AJ Dillon's middle school yards yeah. carry average. And well, what's his what's his name? What does AJ stand for? Yeah, what's his real <laughs> form? <did> you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so let me begin with with one thing. Um, okay, I'll, I'll begin at the beginning at the beginning of the question. I think short to put it shortly, the answer is no. But I believe that both guys will clear eleven hundred scrimmage yards. I think that you'll see, particularly in the passing game, the featuring of the running backs. Uh, more, Even more, and he's thrown the ball to the backs a fair amount before, even more. I think you're going to see this team may lead all teams in the NFL in targets, even more than the Carolina Panthers, believe it or not, may lead all teams in targets in their, to their running backs. So that will get that out of the way in terms of um, um, the yes or no part of it. You get that to do in large part because of the drop off in the receiving core. I think that's part of it, and also both guys are really good receivers. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of it too. I think that uh, they like throwing the ball to these guys because they're they're good receivers. I think that they are both guys who uh, have good natural hands, can give you stuff after the catch. Uh, you know, Quadzilla obviously um, is you know Algiers Jamal. For those who are wondering. Uh, William Dillon Jr. Uh, but Quadzilla is 252 pounds. I mean, if you just look at his actual workout numbers and a blind taste test, right? If you didn't know that I wasn't describing Derrick Henry, you know, what I mean? like his testing numbers are eerily similar, eerily similar to, to, to Henry's. He's a little bit shorter, but his testing numbers are almost exactly the same. And he's a better receiver of the ball. Than Derek. Yes, he is. Yes. Right? So you're talking about a guy who is shorter Derrick Henry, but a better receiver of the football. And he's your second best running back. Right? Yeah. Um, and there's nothing that Christian McCaffrey can do there and Jones can't except dominate the touches. Right. That's the difference between the two. If Aaron Jones got Christian McCaffrey touches, he put up Christian McCaffrey numbers. I'm saying that with, as the kids would say, my chance. All that, all yeah. that, and you still don't think they can do it? I don't, I'm not saying I can't do it. I'm saying that they're going to both cross the 1100 mark. And I think one of them crosses the 1400 mark. I think Jones is over 1400 scrimmage yards. And I think that Dylan comes up 1180 ish or so scrimmage yards. I don't think they get enough, quite enough carries to get there. Yeah. Yeah. But I could see him getting into the, 890 something yards rushing and i think aaron jones gets you know somewhere between a thousand and twelve hundred i mean i think they're going they're both put up really impressive numbers and they're both going to be good fantasy plays as we're talking yeah yeah for sure. oh, God, it's gonna be really good fantasy plays. like he like 
Dylan's not just a handcuff. He's a legitimate RB2 that you yep. can play just to – I mean, play him like you would play a normal RB2. Like, to me, he's in a similar tier with a guy like Fournette and maybe above him now with Fournette pulling the Eddie Lacy routine. <laughs> um, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, exactly what this offense looks like. I like their receiver court slightly more than some people do, but they're going to be a different kind of passing um, I think they're going to look more like a classic West Coast offense than they have since. I have to go back to the time when, like, maybe a guy like Mariucci was the offensive coordinator. I mean, it's going to be some old school, you know, ball control passing, uh, which will be fun fun to watch for people who really are into that. And then some people will whine about it. It depends on how, you, how much you actually like real football or whatever, but. They're, you're going to see it's going to be a good test of several things. But I think that they're both running backs will be super productive. I just don't think they both manage to get a thousand yards rushing. But I, I, once again, my prediction is they both go over 1,100, 1100 plus on two yards and scrimmage. Uh, Chris, uh, final thoughts uh, and uh, any fantasy tips uh, you might want to give us till next week. So I'm um, nothing really a fantasy wise yet. I'm going to start researching here. My guys, um, we actually are going to be deciding our draft order here shortly. We do something fun instead of like pick names out of a hat or something like that. We pick drivers of a NASCAR race because none of us know NASCAR. And then whoever, however, the drivers finish is our draft order. So that's kind of our creative thing. So oh, that's fun. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys some tips here moving forward. My final, final thoughts is um, as a Red Sox fan, I'm a little sad right now because the days of Rafi Devers and Xander Bogarts are numbered right now. And I'm, I'm not liking that because like a couple of weeks ago, everything was good. And we were thinking we're going to be buyers at the trade deadline. And now trade deadline is quickly approaching. And I don't know what's going to happen with Xander Bogarts. And it's, it scares me because I definitely think both of these guys need to be Red Sox for their career. And it just, I just hate this ownership group and the decisions they make because they just don't trust these guys. Like, who in the league is better than Rafael Devers that you're not going to pay him? Like, Juan Soto is probably the only guy you're going to put up there that's on a level like Devers. You judge is you guys are going to make those deals, and just for some reason the Red Sox don't want to pay them. Like, I don't know what else these guys have to prove in order to get contracts from the Red Sox front office. Um, it just drives me nuts. So. I'm going to try to enjoy this last week of maybe Xander Bogarts and Raphael Devers. We'll see what happens. I hope they survive the trade deadline. But if they don't, um, I'm going to be a, a sad camper next week, boys. Yeah. All right, Chris. Hey, as always, man, glad you could join us. Looking forward to Oh, yeah. And then I'll go check out my podcast. Some new ones dropping tomorrow. I've got uh, Nick from No Ceilings on to talk NBA Summer League. He was there on hand talking some players, uh, talking a lot of Keegan Murray because he's a Sacramento guy. So, Go check that out a bit inside pod on Twitter and Instagram. Follow myself, C Kendrick 86 on Twitter and Instagram as well. And uh, I'm going to hop out of here because it's almost midnight boys. Uh, All right, man. Have a good night. Nice I'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Take care. Later. Mike, uh, any fantasy uh, tips and uh, your final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, what I say every time about fa- uh, fantasy tips, know your league rules. I mean, that, that should be, you should know them well enough to know, like, the back of your hand. Um, and if you can get it that far, then you're, you're going to have a lot um, larger step than most uh, managers, owners that come into the draft. Also, number one, too, especially if it's a live draft and you're going to hang out with the buddy's house, buy beer, man. Give it out. Get them all drunk. Let them pass out. And then you just pick whatever you want and you can go to your championship. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you pass out that beer. Uh Outside of that, I think as far as the my final thought, uh, minor league baseball has um, won a huge case. Yep. Um, they uh, major league baseball will have to pay one hundred and eighty five million dollars because of class action suit filed by the minor league baseball players. I guess the suit was back in 2014. So I don't know what took so long, but uh, Aaron Seen. Um, never even heard of the guy. Yes. Um, uh, and a couple other players brought it forward. And now thousands of players um, will receive part of $120 million due to the players 
with resting with the rest going to attorneys and fees and all that other crap. Um, but the the settlement MLB will issue um, allows teams to pay minor league players during spring training, extended spring training, instructional leagues, so forth and so on stuff that they've never been able to do. And, and we know minor league baseball, how crappy it is. I mean, Michael Jordan had to buy a team of bus because he was so uncomfortable um, writing, you know, writing in this, this yep. jalopy thing. So minor league baseball has always been the brunt, the stepchild, and hopefully this, this money will, will carry them a little bit further. All right, Mike. Well, hey, man, always good talking to you. Hope to see you next week and uh, look forward to seeing what those Colts are going to do. Yes, sir. Uh, Have a great uh, um, evening, gentlemen. All right, Mike. Uh, Demetrius uh, usually builds, steals your thunder. So tonight, uh, I'm going to let you have your uh, yeah. final thoughts first. You teed it uh, up. You, you <laughs> know me well enough. You knew what I was doing and you teed <laughs> it up. And so, you know, John Jordan O'Neill Jr needs no intro to guys like us. We know who Buck O'Neill is. Um, I think there's so much there, right? And it's not even about his playing career in the Negro Leagues. or uh, it, it, it's He's going into the Hall of Fame finally, right? Way too late. Um, uh, but, but it is good to see people get their flowers, even if it's way too late. Yeah. But it is, to me, it goes back to the seminal point of I have been a fan of Negro League Baseball my whole life. I've got a Negro League Baseball shirt collection. I've worn Detroit Stars shirts on this podcast. Um, uh, the importance of Negro League Baseball cannot be uh, <clears throat> talked about enough. There needs to be even more talk about it. But I think the seminal moment was in 1994 in the Burns, Ken Burns documentary baseball, where Buck O'Neill personally became a superstar. People, people who should have known. Generations of people who didn't know learned who Buck O'Neill was. And he kind of became the face of Negro League Baseball, which was a great thing. People who don't know, you might know about Satchel. They don't know Josh Gibson. They don't know Coop Papa Bell. They don't know Turkey Stearns. They don't know, like, like we're geeks. We know these guys, right? But when he appeared in that documentary, Buck O'Neill took everything to another level. The attendance at the National uh, Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City if you guys haven't been there, highly recommend. One of the best afternoons of my life. Go. Um, after that documentary, skyrocketed. Skyrocketed attendance there. People didn't know it was there. They didn't know how to get to it. And most people in the know say Buck O'Neill in, in the baseball documentary was a massive part of that. He, he, he got a lot of flowers after we lost him in 06 at the age of 94. He, he got a posthumous... Presidential Medal of Freedom from George W. Bush. Um, uh, uh, baseball had a Civil Rights Day, and they gave him what they called the Beacon of Life Award posthumously. This was in 07. And I also think the Royals did something pretty cool. They created a seat in the stadium. Yeah, they called it Buck O'Neill Legacy Seat, right? Yeah. Quality seat, and they give it to a fan who they think like exemplifies Buck O'Neill's spirit. Now, that's just cool. I love stuff like that. Eat it up. Section 101, row C, seat one, right? And it's different than every other seat in the stadium. It's red and the rest of them are blue, right? But but I finish it up with his own words at the time because this this to me says everything about Buck O'Neill. When he, he didn't get in, a bunch of Negro League guys got in, and he wasn't salty because the guys that got in dirted it. He felt like they deserved it more than him. But he said simply, God's been good to me. They didn't think Buck was good enough to be in the Hall of Fame. That's the way they thought about it, and that's the way it is. So we're going to live life with that. Now, if the Hall of Famer, if I'm a Hall of Famer to you, that's all right with me. Just keep loving old Buck. Don't weep for Buck. Just be happy. That's it. That's the spirit the Royals are talking about. That's the kind of dude that, because you got to think about what it took to make that league work, what it took to make that league survive, the sacrifice that these dudes did. He was a really good example of that. He exemplified it. Um, not many dudes I will speak as highly of as, as John Jordan O'Neill Jr., so congratulations for getting in in 2022. Um, long overdue. Long. Uh, Bill, before uh, I, I let you uh, uh, take us home here, uh, I'm going to acknowledge uh, uh, Bo uh, and uh, the fact that he helped. Uh, I believe he donated over $100,000 to uh, the funerals of uh, the Uvalde victims. Uh, and... Uh, uh, also, uh, the uh, 
uh, the passing away of uh, Charlie Johnson uh, yes. of the Steelers. Uh, so, uh, Bill, uh, I'm going to let you uh, take us home here. Uh, uh, yeah. Mrs. Uh, uh, Robinson turned 100. And uh, we had the opening of the Jackie Robinson Museum. So I'm going to let you take us home on that note. I, I will take us home. And then very briefly, we just talked about a settlement of 120 something million dollars uh, awarded to minor leaguers because they had to eat cheese sandwiches and um, and ride in old buses. Think of what the award would be to the Negro leaguers if right. they were to have a class action lawsuit against Major League Baseball. Yep. They would own Major League Baseball. Exactly. They would own the damn thing. Uh, so what I'll, what I'll take us home on, and I'm sorry we don't have Chris anymore because it, part of it has a Red Sox flavor. On this day in 1959, Pumsy Green took the field for the first time for the Boston Red Sox. And the Boston Red Sox, as many of you know, were the last team to integrate. Uh, so when he finally took the field for them in 1959, every team in the majors had finally played a black player. Um, essentially just 12 years and 70 something days, I think, after Jackie broke the, the original color bar. And also on this day, uh, I think another sort of big deal thing in, in black sports history, but on this day in 1957, the first major US tennis tournament was won by Althea Gibson. And she became the first uh, American born black person uh, to win a, a major in tennis. So this country, uh, which is a country that I love, and I'm not going to pretend I don't love, uh, has, uh, you know, some things to ask for, uh, to be perfectly honest. But I am proud and I am happy when I think back of, you know, some of the things that did happen. And so when she won the... Um, The Australian Open, defeating um, Shirley Fry, Irwin. And then she won Wimbledon. At the time, the Australian was not a, uh, a major. So that was her first win, but it wasn't a major. It was nice, you know, and she won the U.S. singles also, but that wasn't considered a major at the time either. But when she won Wimbledon, that's always been a major. There's no getting around Winning the winning Wimbledon, and you can't call that not a major. And so, uh, she was the first, you know, black female athlete. Um, when she beat Darlene Hurd 6 3 6 2 in uh, in, in straight sets, she changed everything, first of all. Uh, and of all the sports to win a title in, we talk about how hard it was for Jackie. Baseball is a blue collar sport, though. <laughs> I mean, was it hard for Jackie? Sure, hard as hell. That's a blue collar sport. Jackie was probably the most educated guy in almost every, you know, or one of the most in almost every locker room he was ever in. You know, there's a handful of other guys. I mean, Koufax has been a couple of years at University of Cincinnati, but I mean, he has a graduate, right? He didn't just go to UCLA, he had a degree, right? So that's the first thing. Jackie was an educated man, usually around guys who weren't as educated as he was, a blue collar sport. Althea Gibson was the reverse, right? Uh, she didn't have as much education as many of the women in those days that she, that she played against. She sort of didn't have their background, right? Their pedigree and all that other stuff. But she was a better athlete, bigger, stronger, faster. And people didn't like that, right? Um, here's this girl, you know, uh, who comes from, you know, this place where she didn't come up through the, the, the normal channels, right? She didn't have all the right people certifying to her fitness and blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, with all that said, she got to the very top of the game and won a major. Majors, plural. Well, we, she won more than one major than what we would think of now, but there were fewer majors in those days because this is before the open era and all that other stuff. But I want to honor Althea Gibson on this day for what she did on this day in 1957. Well, hey, as always, guys, Appreciate everybody. Uh, looking forward to seeing everybody next Thursday. Get well, man. You sound a little better this week. <laughs>
Yeah, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm pretty good now. I'm almost there. I appreciate you having me. It's always good to be back with the guys on the crib. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, hey, uh, I might hit you. I might hit you up uh, on some Mondays here. Uh, we got some, some more hot political stuff coming. So, you know, have a good I'm night, good. guys. All right, talk to you next yeah. week. You have a good night, sir. Yeah, talk to you next week, man. You have a good one. You too.